Now, a hearing on the National Missile Defense Program. Testifying today before a House panel, Defense and State Department officials, and representatives from the Council on Foreign Relations and Union of Concerned Scientists. They discussed developments in the testing program, including a failed flight test in July. Congressman Christopher Shays chaired the hearing. It's four hours and 20 minutes. The House Subcommittee on National Security, Veterans Affairs, and International Relations uh, is now in, going to undertake a hearing entitled National Missile Defense, Test Failures, and Technology Development. Under the National Missile Defense Act of 1999, quote, it is the policy of the United States to deploy as soon as is technologically possible an effective national missile defense system capable of defending the territory of the United States against limited ballistic missile attack, end of quote. Adopted with broad bipartisan support and signed by the president, the statute answered the question whether to deploy a national missile shield, but could not mandate when a technolo technolo technologically feasible system would be ready. When will effective and affordable National Missile Defense, NMD, technology be ready? That is the question we pose this morning as we undertake oversight of a 10 billion technology development process that has yet to yield a deployable NMD system. The Reagan administration's strategic defense initiative, SDI, hastened the demise of the Soviet Union. Since then, we've moved away from the global vision dubbed Star Wars to merely trying to hit a bullet with a bullet and missing more often than not. Without question, NMD program officials, today stewards of the SDI legacy, confront complex techno technical challenges in a changing strategic, diplomatic, and political environment. This is rocket science and defending against emerging missile threats demands an unparalleled degree of technological precision in, launching de in launch detection, target discrimination, command and control, control coordination, and target interception. Our oversight of other complex weapon systems, the F-22 Raptor and the multi-role Joint Strike Fighter, underscore the importance of permitting technology readiness to drive design and deployment decisions. In those programs, we saw a genuine sense of urgency to overcome test failures, conquer new technology, and meet emerging threats. Is a similar sense of urgency propelling the M MD technology program? A 1998 review of the missile defense program found motion, but not progress. A rush to failure caused in part by poor management and lack of aggressive oversight. The President's hastily announced decision last week to defer initial NMD deployment steps, quote, until we have absolute confidence that the system will work, end of quote, holds proven technologies hostage to an artificial all or nothing standard. Factors other than technical feasibility appear to be constraining NMD success. One of those factors, Russia's refusal to discuss necessary changes to the 1972 anti-ballistic missile ABM treaty could have been ameliorated had the president authorized construction contracts for that part of NMD technology we know will work, the X-band radar facility in Alaska. Under the pressure of inevitable, if distant, NMD deployment, the Russians might be more willing to accede to limited ABM changes rather than face further loss of international stature in the event the treaty is deemed a legal nullity or a strategic anachronism. The ballistic missile threat is real and is growing. China is developing weapons using stolen U.S. warhead designs and appears willing to sell missile technology to rogue nations who may not be tamed by deterrence alone. 
North Korea could resume flight tests and acquire intercontinental missile capability at any time. Development of technology to defend against that threat should be pursued just as aggressively, unfettered by timidity over near-term diplomatic or political fallout. The next president deserves to choose from a complete menu of mature NMD technologies in deciding how best to protect our, nation, our national security. Our witnesses this morning represent a wide range of views on how to implement the national policy on missile defenses. We welcome them all and look forward to their testimony. At this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Tierney, the uh, ranking member. Well, thank you. I'd like to start uh, this morning, Mr. Chairman, by thanking you uh, for scheduling and conducting these hearings. I'd also like to extend my appreciation to the witnesses today for their time, their insights, as well as their testimony. I think President Clinton is to be applauded for his decision last week to defer any decision on deployment of the national missile defense. Those who seek to politicize this issue do the nation a disservice, including those who last December said they would welcome such a decision, but who subsequently claimed that deferral somehow evidences a failure to strengthen Americans' defenses. As I stated earlier, such politicization demeans the seriousness of our need to establish defense priorities based on appropriate non-political criteria. In addition, such assertions are patently inaccurate. Our country's defenses would only be substantially weakened should we move to deployment under current conditions. The President's decision seems to have been the only reasonable one available at this time, given the substantial delays in testing schedules, the severe cost overruns, and several high-profile missile intercept failures. Moreover, it appears to have at least recognized that Russia, China, and our NATO allies oppose deployment because it would violate the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty which they regard as a cornerstone to nuclear nonproliferation. As testimony submitted in writing for today's hearing by Professor Burton Richter clear, clearly states, we are now in the third round of missile defense debates. In rounds one and two, we concluded after much effort that the technology was not up to the job and we opted for arms control. The Nixon administration wanted to defend our missile force and instead signed the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. The Reagan administration wanted to defend the entire nation with what became known derisively and appropriately as the Star Wars defense system, but moved instead to decrease the nuclear threat through a series of treaties to reduce the number of nuclear warheads deployed on each side. Now some propose the intercept in space hit the kill system that would be the most technologically challenging of, of possible alternatives. Rightfully, criteria for development have been set out and have been largely accepted. One, we talk of the changing threat for emerging missile states and the anticipated need for a national missile defense. Two, we talk about the cost of deployment. We talk about the effect of the national missile defense deployment on the United States-Russia nuclear arms reduction process and the broader strategic environment, including effects on our relationships with China, NATO allies, and others. And lastly, we speak of the technological readiness of the system for deployment. While these hearings have been directed by the majority and the chairman mostly at the issue of technological readiness, we must recognize that none of the elements can be reviewed in a vacuum, and consideration of any one necessarily implicates some consideration of others. I should like to add yet another, a fifth, or perhaps a subset of the fourth criteria we must consider before deployment. And that is the likely operational effectiveness of the planned national missile defense system against a real-world attack, which would include countermeasures. The intercept test conducted prior to this date and prior to the President's decision did not assess operational effectiveness of the planned national missile defense. The criterion for deployment should be whether the fully deployed system would be able to deal with countermeasures, not the much more narrow criterion of whether the system can intercept cooperative targets, targets on the test range. If there are countermeasures that would be available to emerging missile states that would defeat the full national missile defense system, that it would make no sense for the United States to begin deploying even the first stage until it demonstrates, first on paper and then on the test range, that the full system could be made effective against such countermeasures. There's no doubt that countermeasure technology exists in even rogue nations right now, and that the capacity exists for them to develop other measures. For instance, the September 1999 National Intelligence Estimate on the ballistic missile threat to the United States asserts that anti-simulation balloon decoys for nuclear warheads a readily available technology that emerging missile states could use to develop countermeasures to United States national missile defense systems. It is only slightly more difficult to implement measures using numerous balloons, which would be much more effective, as would be putting a warhead inside a balloon. A combination of methods, 
tactics of overwhelming the defense and other strategies will be developed and may already exist. So before we deploy at any time, we must consider the four criterion, or the five as I've noted, and satisfy ourselves that the deployment of the national missile defense will actually be needed, as opposed to reliance on deterrence and diplomacy, that costs which seem to be spiraling, even as our confidence in the system remains uncertain, that those costs are in a range warranting deployment of a national missile defense as our best means to answering any threat. A system that in 1996 was estimated to cost between nine and $11 billion now appears to be nearing $50 billion and can be expected to increase. As the Union for Concerned Scientists write, the proposed United States national missile defense system may decrease the security of the United States. Russia and China would respond to the deployment of such a system by deploying a greater number of warheads than might otherwise have been planned. In addition, Russia would likely increase its reliance on launch on warning to ensure that any retaliatory strike would be large enough to overwhelm the national missile defense system. A decision to deploy a national missile defense system would also have a generally negative effect on United States relations with Russia and China and would threaten cooperative efforts to decrease the number of nuclear weapons, improve controls on weapons and weapon materials, and combat proliferation. Finally, the national missile defense system could prompt emerging missile states to concentrate on other modes of delivery. We're a long way from achieving the kind of technological readiness that would provide confidence in the system. The number of tests with real-world conditions would tell if the system would work. A significant number of additional tests than is currently planned would be necessary to establish a high enough level of confidence. A national missile defense would need to be tested in many differing operational environments to take into account different possible countermeasures each of which would require its own set of tests to estimate the, the system's performance under that environment. There must be objective, independent test assessments with authority, meaning at least that the Department of Defense should not be able to disregard the sound advice of the Director of Operational Tests and Evaluation. As Professor Richter said, while the system proposed now has a less ambitious goal than Star Wars, the task is still very difficult and extraordinarily complex and challenging. The intercept and space hit-to-kill system now in development is the most technically challenging of all the possible alternatives. It's the easiest to confuse with relatively simple decoys. The proposed test program is inadequate to ensure the necessary liability before we begin to spend big money on national missile defense. The proposed system is not ready to graduate from development to deployment, and maybe it never will be. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, I'd recognize uh, the gentlelady, Haga Chenoweth. Chenoweth, hey, excuse me. Thank you, Chairman Shays. Um, I, I'd like to thank the subcommittee for taking the time, as you have and are doing now, to examine this very, very critical issue of the feasibility and deployability of the National Missile Defense System. By holding these hear hearings, Chairman Shays, uh, you are opening up an issue that is so, so vitally important and of great interest to the American people. I thank you for being here and holding this hearing after the, after the House has, uh, has temporarily recessed. Mr. Chairman, since the dawn of the space age, we have often heard the crowing of the pessimists. Statements like, it can't be done or it's simply too expensive have been the norm for the day with many programs where technology was a central component existed. Now, People said this about the development of our military fighters in the 1980s and about our tanks, or our military fighters in the 1970s, and about our tanks in the 1980s, and our stealth technology in the 19, 1980s and the 1990s. But each time, these pessimists have been proven wrong. The genius of the American people is such that the seemingly insurmountable becomes surmountable, specifically, in the case of the National Missile Defense System, we are overcoming the failures that, that have so far been encountered. Failures, to a certain extent, are always expected. Now, any fourth grade student learns in his science lessons that failures are central to the scientific process, but they are overcome. Just as we are overcoming many of the technical failures we are now encountering. Mr. Chairman, when Ronald Reagan originally proposed his strategic defense initiative, people ridiculed it by calling it Star Wars. The press accused him of proposing the impossible, and people inflamed the public by saying research in this area could cause a war. 
President Reagan refused to take no for an answer, and as a result, we are now much closer to defending the American public from ballistic missiles. One of the arguments that people of goodwill on both sides of the national missile defense uh, debate raise is the anti-ballistic missile ABM treaty of 1972 in that it prohibits the deployment of a national missile defense shield. However, I question this. Personally, I do not believe that the ABM treaty still constrains us in this way. Because with the death of the Soviet Union, many scholars argue that the ABM treaty is no longer binding. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I, I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record three papers that explore the legal viability and application of the ABM treaty to national missile defense and a timely report by Senator Thad Cochran regarding national missile defense. Without objection. Thank so you, Mr. Order. Chairman. Now, while I'm concerned about the development of national missile defense, I am not one that is overly concerned with te test failures. Tests occur precisely to resolve problems before deployment of our national missile defense system. I have great faith in the ingenuity of our research scientists, and I rest easy knowing that the American uh, that America possesses the very best research scientists and laboratories in the world. And with ongoing research into national missile defense, we are on the cusp of being able to protect America from rogue states like North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. We cannot fail in our efforts to protect the American people. So Mr. Chairman, again, thank you very much for holding this meeting. And by exploring and exploding some of the myths surrounding the technical feasibility of national missile defense, we are providing an important service for the American people. Only through effectively addressing these myths will we ever be able to defend the United States against missile attacks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, it would be my intention to recognize uh, Mr. Allen and, and then uh, Ms. Zakowski and then Mr. Turner, who is a member of the full committee, and Mr. Kucinich, who is a member of the full committee. Both of you are equal participants. It just will be your order will be after the, the regular members, but uh, fully participate. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome all the panelists here today and begin by, by thanking our chairman. Uh, when I was elected to Congress, this is what I thought committee hearings would be like. That is, you'd have people with all sorts, all different points of view coming before us and expressing uh, their opinions, and we would have a chance to sort out the differences. But too often I found uh, the, the panels are weighted so much to one side or another that we don't have that opportunity. So I particularly appreciate uh, Chairman Shea's uh, proceeding as he has with uh, the variety of different panelists and perspectives that we will hear today. Second, I, I do want to begin by saying, let's remember what this system is. This is a very limited system designed to protect against a handful of missiles launched by a rogue nation like, so-called rogue nation, like North Korea or Iran or Iraq. That's it. It's not a shield that protects us from um, major nuclear powers like Russia. It's not a shield that would protect us against what uh, China has or could develop in the future. It's aimed simply against those states of concern, as they're uh, now called. If we're going to make a rational decision about how to proceed with a national missile defense and at what speed, I think we have to keep in mind the four factors that should uh, guide us. They've been stated before, that, but they bear repeating. First, the status of the threat at the time of the decision to deploy. Uh, there is no point in spending 50 or 60 billion dollars on a system if there is no obvious threat that needs to be dealt with. Second. Here, as we struggle with our budget on a regular basis, cost has to be a factor. And uh, just within the last 12 months, the cost of this system has multiplied significantly. Third, the state of the technology. And here I would say there are two technologies. First, there is the technology of being able to hit a bullet with a bullet, uh, the ability uh, to intercept a missile that is fired uh, at the United States. But second, there is the technology of dealing with potential countermeasures. And th that subject has been given more attention in the last few months, but not, in my view, nearly enough. 
because if the countermeasures that are available to so-called states of concern are uh, such that they could overwhelm the kinds of systems that we could develop, then the system will not work as advertised. Finally, we have to pay attention to our arms control agenda, because in the last analysis, diplomacy, if it works, is always cheaper than an arms race. And in this case, diplomacy should not be uh, ignored or pushed aside in the, as we uh, move ahead. I happen to believe that if a national missile defense system works as advertised and strengthens our national security, we should build it. But if a national missile de defense system will not work as advertised, or if it will diminish our national security, we should not deploy it. We should not proceed. And it's the answer to that fundamental choice that I, can, I believe confronts us in Congress and uh, the American people as well that I hope this hearing today will illuminate. And I, again, thank Chairman Shays. Thank the gentleman, uh, Ms. Sikowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much for holding this hearing to, today to discuss our National Missile Defense Program and its technological feasibility. I also want to thank Congressman Tierney for all of his work on this subject and for requesting this hearing today. Last year, when the House of Representatives debated H.R. 4, a bill making the, po the policy of the United States to deploy a national missile defense system when technologically feasible, I stood on the House floor and warned my colleagues that this policy would not enhance the security of the United States, but that it could actually bring this nation closer to war. Since then, we have seen our neighbors around the world express opposition, NATO allies, Russia, China, and others. Russia has warned that it would abandon arms reduction agreements if we go forward with the National Missile Defense Program. China has warned it may increase offensive production. And I stand by the declaration I made last year. Since the Reagan administration, we've been urged by wishful thinkers to deploy a system for which workable technology does not exist. Now, many years and many billions of dollars later, we're still pursuing what I view as an irresponsible, likely unnecessary and unrealistic policy. Believe me, I'm pleased that President Clinton deferred the decision to deploy to the next administration had it not been for the sound advice of some of today's witnesses and others, the situation may have been different. To me, NB NMD is just another example of the Department of Defense spending billions of taxpayer dollars on programs that are destined for failure or are not necessary. As many of my colleagues know, I strongly believe we need a comprehensive strategic review of our defense policy, and I am pleased that today we can start by taking a closer work look at national missile defense. I would like to end with a quote, which is from a, a document produced by one of our witnesses today, Mr. Coyle. Um, deployment, he says, means the fielding of an operational system with some military utility which is effective under realistic combat conditions against realistic threats and countermeasures when operated by military personnel at all times of day or night and in all weather. Such capability is yet to be shown to be practicable for NMD." End quote. Mr. Coyle, of course, will have an opportunity to elaborate, but to me, that sums it up. Not only does deployment risk a whole new arms race and the alienation of our traditional allies and adversaries, it does not work. I know my constituents expect better. Again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to hear from our witnesses and look forward to a healthy discussion today. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with the subcommittee today, and I appreciate you allowing uh, those of us who are not a member of the committee to join with the committee. I, of course, take a great interest in the work of your subcommittee as a member of the full government reform committee, as well as because of my work as a member of the research and development subcommittee and the procurement subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee. I had the opportunity to 
be an original co-sponsor of the National Missile Defense Legislation. I was pleased to do so. I thought it was the right thing to do. I also uh, enjoyed the opportunity to go with a delegation of the Armed Services Committee under the leadership of uh, Subcommittee Chairman Kirk Weldon uh, to Moscow. Uh, prior to the consideration of that legislation, by the House of Representatives to present uh, a report uh, to members of the Russian Duma uh, that outlined uh, the information that we had collected that indicated that there was a real threat uh, to our national security from nations such as Korea and Iran. Uh, that meeting was very productive, though it did not result in our counterparts in the Duma concurring with our proceeding with such a defense system. I think it did represent a good faith effort on the part of the Congress uh, to present to the members of the Duma and their defense committee uh, our thoughts and our reasoning and to present it prior to the passage of the legislation in the Congress. We have, I think, today a greater military superiority over any potential foe than we have possessed at any time in our history. I know there's a lot of discussion, particularly in the presidential race, about our military readiness. Though we always have room for improvement, I'm convinced that we do possess a military that is second to none, for which we should all be very proud. And we are very grateful to those who serve in the uniform of the armed services who defend us every day. It is in our national interest and in the interest of world peace to maintain that unquestioned superiority. National missile defense is, in my opinion, an essential element of achieving that objective. History teaches us that nations inevitably pursue the development of increasingly sophisticated weapons. And I think that uh, the old adage, eternal vigilance is the price of peace, is one we must continue to be mindful of. There is no question that this issue we are discussing today must be approached with reasoned judgment. There are legitimate issues that must be addressed. Issues such as the scope and nature of the threat we face, the technological readiness for deployment, and the diplomatic issues, including, of course, the impact on the ABM Treaty. I have no doubt that the threat is real, uh, that North Korea is developing the ability to deliver uh, a nuclear weapon to the continental United States. I think that threat may also exist from Iran and other nations like Iraq. There are those who desire to achieve military power through the use of nuclear weapons. That is not to say that the delivery of a nuclear weapon by a missile is the only method that may be chosen by a potential foe. I also understand that it is important to be sure that the technology is sufficient to successfully deploy a system. Otherwise, we will pursue a reckless course, spending millions of dollars we would not otherwise have to spend. But I am convinced that we have the ability to be in a position to deploy that the technology will and can be sufficient to accomplish the goal. And finally, I also believe that as we pursue the diplomatic front, and we certainly should pursue it in every way possible, that at the end of the day, that our allies, as well as those who are potential foes, should be able to understand that this is an effort that we're making that is in the interest not only of our own security, but in the security of world peace. And at the end of the day, if we do not achieve agreement with those other nations, I think it will still be in our national interest uh, to deploy a limited system. I concur with the President's decision to defer deployment until the next administration, not because I question the ability uh, to achieve a system that will work, but because I have 
evidenced by the comments of Governor Bush and some of our Republican colleagues in the Congress that there is a debate that will take place regarding the type of system that should be deployed. The information that I have indicates that the threat currently is a limited one and that a system that has the capability of defending against limited attacks will be appropriate. But it is clear that there are others who choose a more, quote, robust approach, uh, a more Star Wars approach, as was advocated in the Reagan administration. And I think this Congress should engage in that debate, and that issue deserves our attention. So I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman, that you have called this hearing today to give us all the opportunity to begin the course of making a reasoned judgment about a very important issue to the American people. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share uh, in this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Turner. The committee is grateful to have your participation and also Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich, you can close up here. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this committee meeting. I, I certainly want to express my appreciation to Mr. Uh, Tierney and the other members of the committee for the work that they have done on this issue. Uh, as uh, some of the members know, this is something that I have been uh, working on for the last uh, year, and I appreciate the fact that Mr. Uh, Shays has called a hearing, which I believe is one of the first opportunities we've had in this House to get into this issue. I, I, I would like to, uh, in some brief remarks here, uh, pose a number of questions. And I think the first question uh, has to be, um, at, that has to be asked is, is this trip necessary? Why are we asking the American people to even consider forking over an additional $60 billion when we have already gone a great distance since 1983 when the Reagan administration first proposed Star Wars to prove that this concept doesn't work, that it is a, an idea in search of an enemy, that it would subvert any effort to be able to have fiscal responsibility in the federal government, that it would undermine our efforts to maintain nuclear nonproliferation, that it would violate the ABM Treaty, and that it would generally be a disaster on a, on a scale that, uh, that hasn't been seen in this uh, country with respect to trying to maintain uh, American leadership for peace in the world. I would submit that peace through proliferation is an Orwellian construction which defies credibility. That you cannot tell the world, as we are in a new millennium, that the way that we can achieve peace is through an arms buildup. Let's sweep aside for a moment the debate over whether or not this is technically possible, because it's not. Let's sweep aside for a moment the debate over whether or not we want to commit tens of billions of dollars to this, because I don't believe the American people do. Let's go right to the crux, what I think is the crux of this overarching debate, and that is, do we really want to get into an era of nuclear proliferation? Are we going to go back to the days of duck and cover drills, where our children are going to be uh, told to get under their desks and get into a crouch and close their eyes and pray that uh, they don't see the flash and pray that they aren't incinerated in some nuclear uh, conflagration? Or are we going to use this opportunity and this debate to come back to the irreducible conclusion that the only way through to peace is through diplomacy. And the only way through nuclear arms reduction is through reducing and eliminating nuclear arms, which was the central purpose of the Nonproliferation Treaty and of the ABM Treaty. This hearing today isn't about castigating people who are serving our country well and who are dedicated to America. We're all good Americans. We all love our country. You don't run for Congress unless you love your country. You don't serve in the military unless you love your country. This isn't about whether we love our country. We all love America. 
And we can all love peace in the world. And we have different views about how to achieve peace in the world. But I think that when we get away from our titles, congressman, general, colonel, and just get to being people, shopping at the West Side Market in Cleveland, people just want to live, they want to survive, and they don't want their government putting them in a position where the peace of the world can be at risk. And that's actually, as Ms. Schakowsky said earlier, that's actually where we're going with this. Over a wacky idea that'll never work, we're engaging in discussions that can actually create destabilization on the issue of peace. Now, when we get into the question and the answers, I'm gonna get into the cost discussions because the American taxpayers are, are interested about whether their money's being wasted or not. But I just appreciated a moment here to just try to interject a note of just plain straight out from the shoulder discussion about an idea whose time should have been long past and about an idea that for some reason, like the movie The Alien, just when you think it's gone, comes out of some compartment. So thank you for all being here. I certainly look forward to the discussion today and I look forward to this continuing uh, debate inside the House of Representatives and across the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the panel's patience, and we just have uh, a little housekeeping to take care of, and then we'll get right to the witnesses. Ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record, and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that written statements from the following individuals be included in the record. Ambassador Henry F. Cooper, Board Chairman, High Frontier, Dr. Burton Richter, Director Emeritus, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and Mr. Joseph Suren Sion, uh, Director, Nonproliferation Project Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And I'll just introduce our witnesses and uh, they can begin their testimony. We have a panel of four individuals, three who will testify. Mr. And we have two panels. Um, Mr. Philip uh, Coyle, Director, Operational Test and Evaluation Department of Defense. Testimony from, Mr. Lieutenant, uh, from Lieutenant General Ronald Kadish, Director, Ballistic Missile Defense Office, Department of Defense, accompanied by the Honorable Edward Warner, Assistant Secretary of Defense Strategy and Threat Reduction Department of Defense. And our third testimony is from the Honorable Avis Bolin, Assistant Secretary, Bureau of Arms Control, Department of State. Uh, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a five minute and we'll roll it over for another five minutes, giving you 10 minutes uh, each for your testimony and then we'll get right to questions. And I will be absent for about 25 minutes and we'll uh, give the floor to Ms. Channelworth to, to start. Mr. Warner, you may start. Uh, excuse me, Warner, I'm sorry. I don't have an opening statement, uh, uh, sir. I'm sorry, Mr. Coyle, we're starting with you and then we're going to Mr. Kadish and then we'll go to uh, Mr. Bowen. Thank you. Chairman Chase. Uh, you know what? I'm sorry, I do need to swear you in before I go, if you'd stand. If you'd raise your right hand, please. Is there anyone else who may be testifying that is accompanied with you, may answer a question? If so, I'd invite them to stand. Is it just be the four of you? Okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I know, know for the record that all four plus one have signed in the firm. Thank you. You may be seated, and uh, Mr. Coyle, you may begin. Chairman Chase, uh, Mr. Tierney, uh, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the testing of the National Missile Defense uh, System this morning. Uh, I've not had the opportunity to address this committee before, and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Uh, you requested that today's testimony focus on the impact of the test results to date on technological maturity and uh, deployment schedules. You also asked that we address the relationship between the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty and the current proposals to design, test, and deploy an effective missile system. First, I'd like to briefly discuss uh, the progress so far. The NMD program has demonstrated considerable progress towards its defined goals in the last two years. The battle management, command, control, and communication system has progressed well. 
The potential X-band radar performance looks promising as reflected in the performance of the ground-based radar prototype. A beginning systems integration capability has been demonstrated, although ach achieving full systems of systems interoperability will be challenging. The ability to hit a target reentry vehicle in a direct hit-to-kill collision was demonstrated in the first flight intercept test last October. However, in this test, operationally representative sensors did not provide initial interceptor targeting instructions, as would be the case in an operational system. Instead, for test purposes, a global positioning system signal from the target RV served to first aim the interceptor. We were not able to repeat such a successful intercept in the two subsequent flight intercept tests. Also, the root cause of the failure in the most recent flight intercept test has not been determined. Because of the nature of strategic ballistic missile defense, it is impractical to conduct fully operationally realistic intercept flight testing across the wide spectrum of scenarios. The program must therefore complement its flight testing with various types of simulations. Overall, NMD testing is comprised of interrelated ground, hardware, and software in the loop testing. Intercept and non-intercept flight testing computer and laboratory simulations, and man-in-the-loop command and control exercises. Unfortunately, these simulations have failed to develop as expected. This, coupled with flight test delays, has placed a significant limitation on our ability to assess the technical feasibility of the NMD system. The testing program has been designed to learn as much as possible from each test. Accordingly, the tests so far have all been planned with backup systems so that if one portion of the test fails, the rest of the test objectives might still be met. Developmental tests in a complex program, especially those conducted very early, contain many limitations and artificialities, some driven by the need for specific early design data and some driven by test range safety considerations. Additionally, the tests are designed so that they will not produce debris in orbit that will harm satellites. Also, the program was never structured to produce operationally realistic test results this early. Accordingly, it was not realistic to expect these test results could support a full deployment decision now, even if all the tests had been unambiguously successful, which they have not been. Notwithstanding the limitations in the testing program, and failures of important components in all three of the flight intercept tests, the program has demonstrated considerable progress. Compliance with the ABM treaty has not had an adverse impact to date on the developmental testing of the NMD system. In the future, we desire additional ground-based interceptor test launches from more operationally representative locations than the existing Kwajalein missile range. Additional target launch sites, which are not restricted by the treaty, would expand the test envelope beyond that currently available, as recommended by the Welch panel, to validate system simulations over the rest of the operating regimes. Furthermore, we need a radar to skin track the incoming RV, reentry vehicle, rather than tracking a beacon transponder has been done with a radar on Oahu. Uh, we need this during early mid-course flight in order to support creation of the weapon task plan, which first aims the interceptor. Some of the options for these improvements could raise ABM treaty issues. Any NMD test activity must be sufficiently well-defined in order to properly assess the ABM treaty implications and determine whether the activity can be conducted under the existing treaty. Under the program of record, Test results are not likely to be available in 2003 to support a recommendation then to support a C, to, then to deploy a C1 system in 2005. This is because the currently planned testing program is behind, because the test content does not yet address important operational questions, and because ground test facilities for assessment are considerably behind schedule. NMD testing needs to be augmented to prepare for realistic operational situations in the operational test phase 
and is not yet aggressive enough to keep pace with the currently proposed schedules for silo and radar construction and missile production. The testing schedule, including supporting modeling and simulation, continues to slip while the construction and production schedules have not. Important parts of the test program have slipped a year in the 19 months since the NMD program was restructured in January 1999. Thus, the program is behind in both the demonstrated level of technical accomplishment and in schedule. Additionally, the content of individual tests has been diminished and is providing less information than originally planned. I'm especially concerned that the NMD program has not planned nor funded any intercept tests until IoT and E, operational testing, with realistic operational features such as multiple simultaneous engagements, long-range intercepts, realistic engagement geometries, and countermeasures other than simple balloons. While it may not be practical or affordable to do all these things in developmental testing, selected, stressing, operational requirements should be included in developmental tests that precede iot and &E to help ensure sufficient capability for deployment. For example, the current C-band transponder tracking and identification system alluded to earlier, which is justified by gaps in radar coverage and range safety considerations, is being used to provide target track information to the system in current tests. This practice should be phased out prior to IoT and E. This will ensure that the end-to-end -end system will support early target tracking and interceptor launch. There's nothing wrong with the limited testing program the department has been pursuing so long as the achieved results match the desired pace of acquisition decisions to support deployment. However, a more aggressive testing program with parallel paths and activities will be necessary to achieve an effective interim operational capability by the latter half of this decade. This means a test program that is structured to anticipate and absorb setbacks that, inev that inevitably occur. The NMD program is developing test, pro test plans that move in this direction. The time and resource demands that would be required for a program of this type would be substantial as documented in the Congressional Budget Office report on the budgetary and technical implications of the NMD program, the Safeguard Missile Program conducted 165 flight tests. The Safeguard Program was an early version of NMD. Similarly, the full Polaris Program conducted 125 flight tests, and the full Minuteman Program conducted 101 flight tests. Rocket science has progressed in the past 35 years, and I'm not suggesting that 100 or more NMD flight tests will be necessary. However, the technology in the current NMD program is more sophisticated than in those early missile programs, and we should be prepared for inevitable setbacks. It is apparent that in these early programs, an extensive amount of work was done in parallel from one flight test to another. Failures that occurred were accepted, and the programs moved forward with parallel activities as flight testing continued. As in any weapons development program, the NMD acquisition and construction schedules need to be linked to capability achievements demonstrated in a robust test program, not to schedule per se. This approach supports an aggressive acquisition schedule if the test program has the capacity to deal with setbacks. On three separate occasions, independent panels chaired by Larry Welch, General Air Force uh, re retired, have recommended an event-driven, not schedule-driven program. In the long run, an event-driven program might take less time and cost less money than a program that must be regularly re-baselined due to the realities of very challenging technical and operational goals. Aggressive flight testing coupled with comprehensive hardware in the loop and simulation programs will be essential for NMD. Additionally, the program will have to adopt a parallel fly-through failure approach that can absorb tests that do, that do not achieve their objectives in order to have any chance of achieving a, a fiscal 2005 deployment of an operationally effective system. As noted by the CBO, the Navy's Polaris program successfully took such an approach 30 years ago. Deployment means the fielding of an operational system with some military utility, which is effective under realistic combat conditions against realistic threats and countermeasures, possibly without adequate prior knowledge of the target cluster composition, timing, trajectory, or direction, and when operated by military personnel at all times of the day or night and in all weather. 
Such a capability is yet to be shown practicable for NMD. These operational considerations will become an increasingly important part of test and simulation plans over the coming years. In the full statement of my testimony, which has been provided to the committee, I make a series of recommendations to enhance the testing program. This includes more realistic flight engagements, tests with simple countermeasures beyond those planned, flight intercept tests with simple tumbling RVs, and tests with multiple simultaneous engagements. Madam Chairman, I'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Coyle, for your testimony. And the chair now recognizes uh, General Kadish for his testimony. Madam Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the National Missile Defense Program this morning and to discuss the impact of the test results to date on our technological maturity and the challenges we face. I have not had the privilege of appearing before your committee until today, and I am pleased to be able to do so. In general, there are basically two ways to look at the program's progress today, and they could be termed the glass half full and the glass half empty views. While our objective is to make the glass completely full, my assessment at the moment is that it is half full. I say this because we have made remarkable progress and substantial technical progress despite two high-profile test failures. As you know, we have been aggressively pursuing the development of the NMD system to achieve operational sta status as soon General, as practical. General, uh, excuse my interruption. Would you pull your microphone closer? Our complex goal of fielding a, a system with a short time frame is not unprecedented. Indeed, it has been compared with the urgent programs to deploy our nation's first nuclear ICBM force. On average, it took four and a half, three quarter years for the Poseidon, Polaris, Triton One, and, okay, I'm sorry. I might start over a little bit. Yes, has, General, would you please start over? Okay. The, Thank you very much. All right. In general, there are two ways to look at the program's progress to date, and they could be termed the glass half full or the glass half empty. While our objective is to make the glass completely full, my assessment at the moment is that it is half full. I say this because we have made remarkable and substantial technical progress despite two high-profile test failures. As you know, we have been aggressively pursuing the development of the NMD system to achieve operational status as soon as practicable. Our goal of fielding a complex system within a short time frame is not unprecedented. Indeed, it has been compared with the urgent programs to deploy our nation's first ICBM force. On average, it took four and three quarter years for the Poseidon, Polaris, Trident One, and two sea launch ballistic missile programs and the Minuteman One, Two, and Three ICBM programs to feel the capability. That is from engineering, manufacturing, and the development stage to the achievement of an initial operational capability. While the proposed NMD system in, is in some ways a more complex system than its predecessors, each of these earlier programs had its own significant managerial, technical, schedule, and political challenges to meet. In other words, our goal of defending the entire country against an emerging threat by an NMD system on an aggressive acquisition schedule does not represent an unprecedented divergence from the way we have procured some major systems in the past. However, it does represent a major divergence from the way we have normally pursued weapons system programs over the past 20 years. I should also point out that all development programs experience problems, especially in their early stages and when pioneering new military capability. The Atlas ICBM program experienced 12 failures in its two and a half year flight testing history, 
and the Minimat 1 program suffered 10 failures in three and a half year testing program. The Corona program in the early 60s to deploy our first strategic reconnaissance satellite survived 12 failures and mishaps before the first satellite could be successfully orbited. Its engineering challenges, including mating an unproven satellite to a booster, launching a multi-stage rocket, separating the payload in space, ensuring the right orbit, orienting and operating optical sensors, and coordinating the ejection of film capsules, recovering the undamaged capsule after re-entry. The point is that birthing a revolutionary technology and making it useful is a tough engineering job that requires discipline, patience, and vision. To expect all activities to be successful is unrealistic given the history of such endeavors. When our nation faced great need, program support by our national leadership persisted despite frustrations resulting from test failures and technical difficulties. As a result, once troubled programs have made profound contributions to our national security. Over the past 11 months, the NMD program has had two failures in the three intercept flight tests conducted so far. While these were disappointments, we were able to collect valuable information on the integration of the system, and we have a full schedule still ahead. Let me briefly discuss a little different perspective on operational testing. These early integrated flight tests that I mentioned do not meet the generally expect, accepted defini definition of operational realistic testing that Mr. Coyle pointed out. They were never intended this early in the development phase. Ours is a walk before you want run approach. We have just recently entered the fully integrated testing phase, after which the tests in our current plan will become progressively more stressful. The increasing complexity of our tests will involve, among other things, greater discrimination challenges, longer ranges, higher closing speeds, and day and nighttime shots. The way our current testing program is planned, we will do a series of tests that become increasingly operational real realistic by the time the final independent operational test assessments must be made. This occurs years later in the program test series. Now I'd like to discuss some other fact of life testing issues, specifically range limitations. Range limitations are an inescapable reality and a direct result of the fact that our test range extends over about 4,000 square miles of the Pacific Ocean. These test restrictions include safety constraints on missile overflight and impact areas. I'm sure you, we'd hear about it if the missile parts came raining down on Californians or Hawaiians or startled fishermen in the Pacific Ocean. We also don't want to add to the space debris that it might threaten orbital or space launch paths. The effect of these restrictions is that we are permitted to flight test in only a limited part of the designed operating envelope and along different geometries than those from which potential missile threats might appear. We have to use robust simulations that are firmly anchored on and updated from data from earlier ground and flight tests to test the system under conditions our test ranges cannot permit. These restrictions were highlighted in both General Welch's and Mr. Coyle's independent reports, and we need to address them as we proceed with the program. We are doing that. It's not that we don't want to change the restrictions, but the cost, risk, and policy issues must be resolved. These fact-of-life constraints, however, do not represent a problem for the near term, but we can increase our confidence in the system as we proceed if they are addressed now. Just to give you an example, let's consider the necessary role of the so-called C-band beacon transponder and the global positioning system or GPS equipment attached to the target warheads. These are necessary outgrowths of our testing limitations. 
none, I repeat, none of this equipment in any way aids the kill vehicle in finding, discriminating, or intercepting the target during the final stages of the flight test. The C-band beacon is necessary for the surrogate radar in Hawaii to act as if it were an upgraded early warning radar, since we do not have one downrange for the test. The GPS system allows the manager controlling the test to monitor the location of the target for range safety. It also provides the engineers examining post-test data a critical source of validation information. It helps us to know what we saw or thought we saw at any precise time during the engagement. These beacons answer two of the most critical needs of the any test program, ensuring the safety of all in the area, in this case the South Pacific, and ensuring we receive the comprehensive and adequate set of data. Should our other tracking systems fail during the test and thus not provide the target's location adequately, we would, as a last resort, use the GPS data to direct the kill vehicle to its sensor acquisition area in order to salvage the end game aspects of the test. In this case, we recognize it would no longer be a successful integrated system test but it would provide more and useful information on the autonomous homing and discrimination capability of the kill vehicle. Again, this is only as a backup in the event of radar failure in the middle of what is a very expensive flight test. Finally, I'd like to discuss countermeasures. Countermeasures and counter countermeasures are part of the continuing interaction of offensive and defensive systems throughout history. They are not new, nor are they unforeseen or unplanned for. The NMD system is itself a countermeasure against the threat of ballistic missiles. The United States understands the challenge of missile countermeasures. We've been in the missile business for a number of decades now, and we've developed some very sophisticated sensors, computers, and discriminants. We are continuing to refine these capabilities. But it is fair to say that we have not fully tested the NMD systems against countermeasure suites we expect. It's too early in our development effort. Our early test objectives are focused on accomplishing the basic technology of hit to kill. We do, however, have great confidence based on the testing and analysis we have done so far that we will be effective against the countermeasures we expect. And our future testing will confirm that confidence. Still, critics continue to fuel the skepticism surrounding the issue by using a simple technique. Theory and practical application are the same. In other words, countermeasures may be easy science on paper, but effective ones are not all that simple to develop and even less simple to implement. The engineering challenges are very substantial. Structural issues can affect range, accuracy, and payload. And no nation can place confidence in the effectiveness of its program without testing. Those who argue that a system can be defeated by countermeasures usually base their argument on assumptions that favor the offense while downplaying the capabilities of our emerging defensive system. In my view, credible, sophisticated countermeasures are costly, tough to develop, and difficult to make effective against our NMD design. Simple, cheap attempts can be readily countered by our system. I have made more extensive comments on this countermeasure issue in my written comments. In summary, Madam Chairman, I believe our glass is half full. We have made remarkable progress. We have shown that the foundation of our system, hit to kill, is achievable. While the test failures we've had so far are certainly disappointments, they are not unprecedented for the, for the program of this scope. We have major challenges ahead as we work to continue to fill the glass, and my goal is to fill it, but the progress to date has been solid. The challenges are no longer ones of basic science and technology. We know our fundamental design can work. The challenge before us are those of engineering and integration and building reliability into the system. Engineering schedule challenges and the technology integration tasks are tough. We are, however, 
ready to proceed aggressively. Thank you. Thank you, General Kadish, for your testimony. The chair now recognizes Ms. Boland for her testimony. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman, Mr. Tierney, members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss our National Missile Defense Program and how it relates to the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. It is this administration's position that we should not move forward with deployment of an NMD system until we have full confidence that that system will work and until we have made every reasonable diplomatic effort to minimize the cost of deployment and to maximize the benefit. I am obviously not in a position to speak on the technical or programmatic issues related to this system. General Kadish and Mr. Coyle have authoritatively addressed those aspects of the program. Instead, Madam Chairman, I will focus my brief remarks on the diplomatic and political context in which we have pursued the development of an NMD system and the diplomatic and foreign policy ramifications of deploying such a system. When the President decided last summer for planning purposes on an initial NMD architecture, he stated that he would make a decision on whether to deploy this system based on four criteria our assessment of the threat, technological feasibility, cost, and the overall impact on national security. A week ago today, as you know, the President announced that the NMD program is sufficiently promising and affordable to justify continued development and testing, but despite impressive progress that there is not sufficient information about the technical and operational effectiveness of the entire NMD system to move forward with deployment at this time. In making this decision, the President took into account the four criteria I just mentioned, and he made clear that we will continue to work with our allies and with Russia and with China to strengthen their understanding of and support for our efforts to meet the emerging ballistic missile threats and to explore where appropriate creative ways we can co cooperate to enhance their security against this threat as well. Let me say just a few words about the diplomatic and foreign policy context of NMD. At the end of the day, as the President has repeatedly state, stated, no country can exercise a veto over a decision that he or a future President might conclude is in the best interests of the United States. But as he also noted in his speech last Friday, while an effective NMD can be an important part of our national security strategy, it can never be the sum total of that strategy or of our, a strategy to deal with nuclear and missile threats. We cannot fail to take the views and security requirements of our friends and allies into account as we move forward on this program. We have an obligation to do what is necessary to achieve consensus within the NATO and Pacific alliances which are essential to our own security and to reassure others of the steadfast commitment of the United States to preserving the international arms control regimes that, that they have come to rely on for our, their own security. To quote the President again, over the past 30 years, Republican and Democratic presidents have negotiated an array of arms control treaties with Russia. We and our allies have relied on these treaties to ensure strategic stability and predictability with Russia, to get on with the job of dismantling the legacy of the Cold War, and to further the transition from confrontation to cooperation with our former adversary in the most important arena, nuclear weapons. We continue to believe that the ABM Treaty is, quote, a key part of the international security structure we've built with Russia, and therefore a key part of our national security. For that reason, we have sought to strengthen and preserve the treaty even as we pursue our efforts to develop a national missile defense. We continue to believe that strategic stability based on mutual deterrence between ourselves and the Russians is still important in the post-Cold War period because we and the Russians still have large nuclear arsenals. The ABM Treaty provides a framework for ensuring strategic stability between our two countries, 
reducing the risk of confrontation and providing a basis for further strategic reductions. Clearly, deployment of the NMD system we are developing would require changes to the ABM treaty. The deployment of an ABM radar at Shemi, Alaska, of 100 ground-based interceptors and five upgraded early warning radars for the defense of all 50 states would violate the obligation contained in Article I of the treaty not to deploy an ABM system to defend national territory. Such activities would also be inconsistent with the locational restrictions of Article III of the treaty. We, of course, do not believe that the proposed system would violate the core purposes of the treaty and, in fact, believe that updating the treaty to permit a limited NMD would strengthen it. Accordingly, since last summer, we have engaged at the highest levels in extensive discussions with Russia with the objective of reaching agreement on modifications in the ABM Treaty, which would permit us to move forward with the limited NMD system proposed this, by this administration within the ABM Treaty. We have, to this end, provided to Russia a draft protocol to the Treaty. Among U.S. allies, support for NMD is strongly conditioned on first securing Russia's agreement to cooperatively amend the ABM Treaty. In the broader international community as well, support for U.S. nonproliferation objectives and other foreign policy priorities is also often linked to preservation of the ABM Treaty. The degree to which other nations perceive that they have a stake in preserving the ABM Treaty was clear during the, uh, last, this year's uh, NPT Review Conference. For our allies and others, the ABM Treaty, as a touchstone of U.S.-Russian strategic stability, is clearly perceived as an important foundation of the whole structure of international strategic security. In the consultations that Under Secretary John Holm has conducted with his Russian counterparts, as well as discussions at other levels, we have addressed three broad areas designed to meet specific Russian concerns. First, we have made clear to Moscow that in deploying a limited NMD system, we are responding to a new threat from long-range ballistic missiles in the hands of states that thre threaten international peace and stability, and we are not seeking to change the core foundation of strategic stability with Russia. We have told our Russian interlocutors that we believe the ABM Treaty should be preserved and strengthened by adapting it to a new strategic environment that did not exist in 1972, using the amendment procedures that are established by the terms of the treaty itself. We have proposed only those treaty changes that we believe are necessary to allow the United States to address those threats we expect will emerge in the near term while also establishing the basis for further adaptations of the treaty in the future should the emerging threat warrant. Secondly, we have sought to demonstrate to the Russians that a limited NMD system will not threaten their strategic deterrent and cannot be made to have that capability. Indeed, criticism by Russian officials of our NMD program has not focused so much on the impact of our proposed system on their deterrent, but rather on their concern that these deployments would establish an infrastructure that would allow future breakout. Finally, we have proposed to the Russians a series of confidence building and transparency measures. To date, as you know, the Russians have not agreed to our proposals to amend the ABM Treaty, treaty but we have come considerably closer to agreement on some key aspects of the problem. For example, on the nature and reality of the threat. This progress is reflected in the joint statement on a strategic stability cooperation initiative that was signed by Presidents Clinton and Putin uh, in New York on Wednesday. And I have copies of that, um, of that initiative if uh, the members of the committee have not had a chance to, to see that yet and would be happy to submit it for the record. We have also been 
pursuing close consultations with our NATO and Pacific allies, who have all made clear that they hope the United States will pursue strategic defense in a way that preserves the ABM Treaty. Their support is important to us for a number of reasons. Our European and Asian allies are crucial to our efforts to counter the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, including ballistic missiles and missile technology, efforts which continue to be a strong line of defense against the threat of missile, missile proliferation. Moreover, an effective NMD will require the consent of two allies to upgrade the radars that are situated on their territory. Our allies have uniformly welcomed the President's decision to defer a decision on deployment as providing more time for discussion of the emerging ballistic missile threat and the role of ballistic missile defense in responding to that threat. We will continue this dialogue with our allies in the months ahead. We have also made clear to China that our national missile defense efforts are not directed against, uh, against them. In sum, Madam Chairman, the President's decision has given us more time to work toward narrowing our differences with Russia and to involving our allies in shaping a coordinated response to the emerging ballistic missile threat. We continue to believe that an effective NMD system can be developed and deployed within the context of resolving the concerns of our allies and the objections of Russia. Let me conclude by reiterating a point the President made in his speech last Friday. He said, no nation can have a veto over American security. Even if the United States and Russia cannot reach agreement, even if we cannot secure the support of our allies at first, the next President may nonetheless decide that it is in America's national interest to go forward with deployment of NMD. But by the same token, since the actions and reactions of others in the world bear on our security, clearly it would be far better to move forward in the context of the ABM Treaty and Allied support. America and the world will be better off if we explore the frontiers of strategic defenses while continuing to pursue arms control, to stand with our allies, and to work with Russia and others to stop the spread of deadly weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boland, for your testimony. And the chair now first recognizes Mr. Tierney. We are in the section now where each member will be recognized for five minutes for their questions. Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Mr. Coyle, thank you for your testimony. Uh, as I mentioned during my remarks earlier, I'm particularly concerned about the issue of countermeasures. Uh, let me make sure that I understand your written testimony. You stated that targets in flight tests will have at most unsophisticated countermeasures and that they will employ only simple balloon decoys. Did I get that right? That's correct. Are you talking about just flight tests prior to the deployment readiness review or all flight tests for the test program? Uh, both. both. The test prior to the deployment readiness review uh, only had a simple balloon as the as the as the decoy, and the tests that are projected out into the future, uh, so far only are using uh, for the flight intercept tests. I should say that are projected out into the future only use uh, simple balloons as decoys. So other countermeasures that are readily available, uh, cooled shrouds, for example, uh, that reduce the radiation emitted by warheads. There's no planned test for that. Uh, th those would not meet the, the definition of an unsophisticated threat. Uh, the C-1 system is designed only to meet uh, so-called unsophisticated threat. And so a countermeasure like the cooled shroud that you mentioned would, would have to be uh, dealt with with future versions of the NMD system called C-2 or C-3. But the, those types of, of countermeasures do exist yet there's no plans made to deal with them, at least in the C-1 stage. And that, was, that also would be true for uh, tumbling RVs and things of that nature, other countermeasures? Uh, tumbling RV is a different matter. Uh, that might actually be the simplest thing for uh, a nation to uh, deploy. 
Uh, the easiest thing of all is don't even spin up the RV, just let it plop off the end. Uh, it's not as accurate when you do that, uh, but, um, but it is simpler. And so that's one of the reasons why I've recommended, and so has uh, General Welch's panel, that we uh, uh, try some tests with tumbling RVs uh, uh, along the way. On the balloon decoys that are scheduled for a test later in the program, to your knowledge, will they have a shape or motion similar to the target reentry vehicle? Uh, some of the balloons will be about the same size, um, but they won't have uh, the same motion uh, as the reentry vehicle. And what about our radar on the ground? Has the X-band radar been tested during a flight test to determine whether it can deal with sophisticated or unsophisticated decoys? Uh, so far, the only decoys we've used uh, have been a, a single, simple uh, balloon. Later on, there will be tests with balloons that have uh, uh, radar uh, absorbing material on them, but just balloons. Just balloons. Mr. Tierney, can I uh, add to that a little bit? Sure. Uh, General uh, Kadish. The, uh, the flight test program we have does not only consist of intercept flight tests. We have other flight tests that we call risk reduction flight tests that we fly against the radar and other sensors separately. And we have done a number of those tests against a wide range of countermeasures, including jammers. So although they were not intercept tests, they were against our sensors, and we'd be glad to provide that data to you in the appropriate context. And I assume Mr. Coyle has that data. Yes, and, and those, are, those are fine tests to do. Um, we certainly support them, um, but they are not intercept tests, and so they only go as far as they go. I, I mean, I guess what I'm talking about here is, is two things. One is effectiveness, you know, whether or not you test to see if it works. The other is our level of confidence in, in any of this. If you test it and it works once, that doesn't give us a great deal of confidence, as it might if you test it several times or test all the different permutations. Uh, that we could expect to see. Mr. Coyle, in your testimony, you stated that there might be different synergistic effects when multiple missiles are deployed. What did you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> we uh, probably should assume that if uh, a, a so-called rogue state uh, were to uh, send intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, towards the United States, that they wouldn't just send a single missile that they might send two or more, uh, maybe several. Um, and so part of the challenge would be to see that you could deal with more than one uh, incoming missile at once. Does the current flight test plan test against multiple targets at all? Uh, so far, there are no tests like that planned. Now, the Rumsfeld Commission reported that countries with the technolo technology to develop missiles most likely have the technology to develop countermeasures. So I'm assuming you would agree that this is not a side issue to be dealt with somewhere down the road. It's you trying to tell me something? Gentlemen's uh, time is up. May um, I finish the question? Yes, please do. Thank you. You would agree with me, sir, that this is not a side issue to be dealt with somewhere down the road, that this is a fairly integral part uh, of our determination of whether or not the system is going to be effective and whether or not we'll have a sufficiently high level of uh, confidence in the system. Uh, yes, that's why we've been recommending that uh, these other kinds of tests will need to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Ms. Bowen, um, I guess I need to have you explain to me, um, like Vince Lombardi used to, this is a football. Because the issue of the viability of the ABM Treaty still troubles me. The original ABM Treaty, of course, was signed with the Soviet Union, the Union of Soviet States, and that no longer exists. And while the Confederation of Independent States is who our uh, administration is working with, a new treaty with a new signator has not been accomplished that has been ratified by the United States Senate. How is it then that the administration is relying so heavily on an ABM treaty that has not been ratified or the old treaty that 
one of the two signatories no longer exists. Madam Chairman, I will answer your question in, in two parts, if I may. Uh, first of all, obviously, this is a there's a complex. It's a complex issue with many many parts to it, and I think um, the administration's position is is well known. But to to have a complete answer, perhaps the best thing would be to submit a question in in writing. Um, but I would um, I would just um, add to that that um, um, I think um, in we have operated on the general principle that as a matter of international law, agreements in force between the United States and the Soviet Union at the time of the dissolution of the Soviet Union are presumed to, uh, to continue in force with respect uh, to the Soviet successor state. And I think there is a long record on this going back to the, uh, to the Bush administration. So that is the second part of my answer. But um, if, if you would be pleased to submit a, a, a question, we would be very happy to, um, to answer it. Thank you. I will, Ms. Bowen. Um, I think it troubles many Americans that we're engaging in a contract or a treaty where one of the two signatories no longer exists. And uh, it is an assumption on the part of the administration. But the Senate has a role here as do the American people, in having the administration produce a signed treaty that must be ratified by the Senate. Is there, and I thank you for your answer, and I will submit my question in writing and look forward to your written answer. Is there anyone else on the panel who would like to address this issue? I want to thank you for your testimony, and while I agree that diplomacy is exceedingly important, I guess I just have to think that as we move from a nation whose major military policy was mutual assured destruction to um, a new vision in the future, um, not so new since the 1980s, of protecting and defending Americans from foreign attack um, as, as our number one priority, I hope, in the future. I think it's a, a very worthy, worthy goal. And uh, I guess I just have to echo what my former boss, uh, former Senator Steve Sims, used to say, um, I'm a dove. I just think we ought to be the best armed doves on the planet. And uh, I think that he said that back in the 1980s, and I think it still holds true. Um, General Kadish, your testimony was very informative, a very interesting study. But I do want to ask you, the, as you know, the president announced, and this has been referred to in, other, in testimony today, that he was uh, deferring to the next administration the decision on whether to deploy the planned uh, national missile defense system. Now, neither the president nor the Department of Defense provided information on the effect that this decision will have on the near-term national missile defense options for, the, for our next president, whomever that might be. General Kadish, what was your organization's recommendation to the administration regarding the decision to defer to the next administration the decision on whether to deploy the planned NMD system? General Kadish. And Chairman, we in the uh, program office and at the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization worked very hard to provide all the information required for the decision. And we presented that information as factually as possible uh, up through the decision makers. And uh, we did not provide a specific recommendation, but an integrated assessment of the status of the program. I see. My time is up, and uh, I now recognize uh, Mr. Allen for his questions. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me return quickly to the, to the subject of countermeasures. In your testimony, uh, General Kadish, you said that this is a system to defend all 50 states against a limited attack involving intercontinental ballistic missiles with unsophisticated countermeasures launched by states of concern such as North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. Well, buried in the word unsophisticated is an is a important issue. It seems to me that we, almost any state, 
Well, let me back up for a moment. The Rumsfeld Commission some time ago warned us that uh, North Korea was proceeding more rapidly than some in our intelligence community had expected with the development of missile technology. It is easier, in, so far as I can tell, and you can react to this, to determine uh, how a country is proceeding on its missile technology than on its countermeasure technology. And it seems to me that we have limited information, classified, about the uh, countermeasure technology that states of concern may have or may acquire in the future. And on the other hand, our own sensors, the technology around our own sensors and our ability to discriminate amongst, uh, among countermeasures, such as decoys of one kind or another, is also classified. And yet, if an adversary that can build a, a, an ICBM has sophisticated and not unsophisticated uh, countermeasures, this system may not work at all. And uh, if you would react to that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Allen, the, uh, as I tried to point out, there is no military system that I'm aware of that is perfect, either on the offense or the defense. So with that in, as a basic assumption, some of them, however, are pretty good. In the basic architecture that we laid out for the National Missile Defense Program is that we would start with an initial capability that we term for purposes of discussion C1 for unsophisticated countermeasures based on the intelligence community's best estimate of what we would expect to see in the time frame that we're talking about in the 2005 or mid-decade area. In addition, the system has inherent capability to go beyond that, even though we would not necessarily design and, and uh, test aggressively to some of the more sophisticated countermeasures in the early phases. But we had always planned to have follow-on phases, at one time called Capability 2, or Capability 3 as we now refer to it, where the sophisticated countermeasures would be incorporated into our testing and design activities. So you need to look at the National Missile Defense Program not as an end item that is static forever. If you do, we miss the point here because we will never be successful against the countermeasure issue. We do not view it that way. We view it as an ongoing, aggressive activity that addresses the countermeasures in, a, in an action response method based on our best intelligence and the inherent capability of the system. If I can get one more question in. We've had all this conversation about Shemya and the construction of radar facilities at Shemya in Alaska. Let's suppose that through negotiation or otherwise, North Korea abandons its missile program. Of what use against Iran or Iraq would be a radar facility at Shemya in Alaska? Iran and Iraq, there would be little use. It's in the wrong spot, and the curvature of the Earth plays a major activity. But let me just make one, I'm not, this is not a question, but one, one comment. One, it's, it may be beyond the scope of these hearings today, but I'm just one concern I have is that uh, it seems to me that advocates of missile defense are not taking account of the logical and necessary responses that some others in the world would have to make. And it's not just Russia, it's not just the, US, the ABM Treaty, it is also China. And China now has about 20 ICBMs, a very limited force. Uh, it seems to me that uh, a a, 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 an almost automatic response by the Chinese to the development of this system would be to increase their missile force. That sets off potentially a chain reaction with India and Pakistan. Causes me great concern. As I say, maybe uh, Ms. Bolin, if that's something you feel you could address today, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Um, my first answer to that would be that China is already independently of our national missile defense program, as you know, engaged in a strategic modernization um, program. And um, this, is, this is unrelated to, um, to what we have done. So, and, and this will considerably um, increase their force, increase their, uh, their sur survivable force. Um, 
China's objections are, are well known. They have been very public. We have had a dialogue with them also to try to uh, persuade them that, uh, that this system is not um, in any way directed against them or against their, um, against their deterrent. And obviously, in their minds, it becomes very much linked with the whole issue of Taiwan and theater missile defenses in the, in the region. So we have tried to establish a clear boundary between those, uh, those two issues, and we will um, continue those efforts at dialogue. But we also anticipate that whatever is decided about NMD, the, the Chinese strategic force will be considerably larger um, in a few years than it is now. Thank you. If, Thank you. if I might comment also, uh, Mr. Allen, uh, just on the, in, the link to India and Pakistan, China has a range of missiles of, of varying ranges, uh, ones of a theater character, ones they are expanding it's substantially, for instance, and those that are opposite Taiwan. It is really theater range missiles that pose the main threat to South Asia, as it would see it. So the growth in their ICBM capability is unlikely to be that directly relevant. I believe that growth is underway, very much as uh, Ms. Boland just described. The strategic modernization of China's force has been underway for, a, for well over a decade. Uh, we anticipate uh, expansion and, and greater technological capability over time. Uh, the South Asia piece, not lessening it at all, but it is tends to be more related to the pattern of which China modernizes its intermediate range missiles, which can easily range into those countries. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kucinich, you have the floor for five minutes. We'll be coming back with a 10-minute round after members have gone the first pass. And I'd like to note that uh, Chairman of the full committee, Mr. Burton, is here. And uh, we'll go to you after Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Uh, Mr. Shays. I'd be, I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Burton. I, I at least uh, yield you know, my place to him if you come back. Well, thank you, Mr. Kucinich. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I don't want to be redundant. I just got here, so if I cover some ground that, uh, that uh, has not yet, or that has already been covered, please forgive me. Uh, one of the things that's concerned me as uh, chairman of the committee and as uh, a member of Congress, and I think my colleagues as well, has been the theft of uh, nuclear secrets at uh, Los Alamos and uh, Livermore. And a lot of people have said that the uh, theft of those secrets uh, uh, could be analogous to what happened with the Rosenbergs back in the 50s. I mean, it's a major, major problem, and, and we talked to a number of people about that. Uh, as I understand it, the W88 warhead technology is now in the possession of the Chinese Communist government. And they also have other technology through uh, uh, their connections with Laurel and Hughes and other companies regarding their space uh, satellite technology. They now have the ability to build an ICBM, and they have also have the ability to, uh, to put multiple warheads on one missile. And they also have the technology to put that on a mobile launched vehicle that could be hidden in woods or someplace else, which would be very difficult for our spy satellites to pick up. And the question I have, and I address this to any one of you, is that how long will it be before they, and just, I know this is an estimate, how long will it, or guesstimate, how long will it be before they have a mobile launched ICBM or a permanently fixed ICBM silos with multiple warheads such as the W88 warhead that, where they could put eight to 10 on one missile? How long will it be before they have one of those operational? And uh, what does that mean for the United States security? And do we have any way, do we have any way right now or in the foreseeable future to intercept and shoot down the multiple warhead missile if it's launched at the United States? In other words, how long is it going to take for them to perfect it uh, in your estimation? Once it's perfected, uh, if they launch it at the United States, do we have any defense for it? And also, because of the Merving, because they got as many as 10 warheads on it, once those split apart in the outer, outer atmosphere, uh, could we shoot down all 10 of those uh, 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 smaller missiles with the W88 warhead, or would we just uh, lose a bunch of cities in the United States? I know it's a pretty big question, but uh, I'd like to have an answer if I could. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There has been a there has been a recent uh, national intelligence estimate on these matters, uh, and it's 
at the classified level. Uh, I could let me just generally say that the Chinese have been their next generation capability, both of intermediate range and long range, is mobile in character. One of their main efforts. So they have a mobile missile capability in train. Uh, I don't have the unclassified date, so I won't speculate on that. But we can certainly make an arrangement to make that available to you. Similarly, we've long believed that the Chinese have the capability to move toward multiple independent reentry vehicle capability in the years ahead, and I, I'm virtually positive that that also is examined in that estimate, and we would be happy to bring it okay, to you. Okay. Well, how about the last part of the question? Let's say, for for instance. And I'm not asking you to divulge any classified information because you don't want to give the exact timetable. And any one of you can answer this. Let's say, for instance, that they do in five years have an ICBM that is mobile launched or in a silo that has multiple warheads and they launch it at the United States. Do we have any defense capability that would shoot down those incoming ICBM uh, missiles, the, the MIRV warheads? And uh, uh, if we don't, uh, they could hit as many as what eight or ten cities, and uh, the, the, I presume that would uh, that would amount to a, a real devastation of our economy and also cost us maybe uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 million people. Let me turn to General Kadish on the scheduling and timing, but put, put a couple of things quickly into context. First, of course, the primary objective of the NMD system being uh, that has been examined and developed by this administration has been linked to the question of the so-called states of concern like North Korea, Iran, and Iraq. It is a fact that it inherently has capability to also intercept uh, missiles uh, from nations like China or Russia, or it would have when it were available. On when it is available now will depend, as President Clinton made the decision last week, now on the next president. We have a program underway that will provide an option for the next president to have such a capability in the middle part of this decade if he chooses to move in that direction, whoever that may so be. So what you're saying is if we had a, the next president were to move very expeditiously on this, sometime within five or six years, we could have a system that could intercept and shoot down uh, uh, multiple warhead missiles the, the coming C1 out. capability is generally uh, aiming at uh, the C-1 and C-1 enhanced is somewhere between a handful to a few tens of reentry vehicles in flight. So by the time the C-1 enhanced were, in, uh, were deployed, which could be in 2006, 2007 time frame, uh, now as to the issue of whether it would be include, the, it would depend on the degree of the countermeasures that might accompany uh, the Chinese attack because this one, as we've just talked about, is against simpler countermeasures. Thank you, Mr. Could Chairman. I, could I? I'm yes. happy to have you respond. Just, um, just to add to that, I, I, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that, that uh, we have no defenses against China's present strategic system. It's not the addition of a mobile, uh, a mobile system that will, uh, that will make us more, more vulnerable. But um, a more important point is, I think we, we, you need to focus on the limited size of the, of the force and the modernization. Clearly, we are not looking at a modernization that would in any way or dimension approach uh, the size of the Russian force, which is, uh, um, which is still arrayed, um, arrayed against us or has been arrayed against us. Yeah, well, if, the, with, 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 if the chairman would just and, give me just a second. Yeah. I know that, but that, that begs the issue, one missile launched at the United States, hitting New York City or Chicago or Los Angeles would be devastating as far as loss of population and what it would do to our economy, just one. And so whether or not they have the capability to launch 30, 40, 50, or 60 missiles at one time really isn't the issue. Do we have the ability to shoot down or stop a missile of that type from hitting the United States? We do not have at the present time, and according to what was just said, we're looking at the middle of the decade at the very earliest. The next decade, that's if the president, the new president, gets on the stick and gets the daggone thing underway. And so the big concern that I have is, you know, uh, we don't anticipate conflict with anybody in the future, but you don't know what might happen. And so uh, it seems to me that the, uh, the, the responsible thing to do would be to get on with it as quickly as possible. And unfortunately, that's, that's not what's happening right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to direct my uh, uh, first question to uh, Mr. Coyle. For, in your testimony on page 27 under observations and conclusions, uh, you come up with, uh, uh, you say, additionally, the program will have to adopt a parallel, quote, fly-through failure approach that can absorb tests that do not achieve their objectives in order to have any chance of achieving a fiscal year uh, 2005 deployment of an operationally effective system. I want everybody to think about this for a moment. Now, where I come from, Cleveland, Ohio, if something fails, doesn't fly. Or if something doesn't fly, it fails. Uh, you can't keep flying if you keep failing. Now, right here in your comment, you talk about a fly-through failure approach, which implies that it fails, but it keeps flying. Do you want to help me with that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the only point I was trying to make there was that there will be failures in the test program. Um, and if everything is in series, uh, every time you have a failure, it sets back the whole program and the whole program take longer and longer and longer. If the country uh, uh, expects to be able to achieve the kind of capabilities we're talking about on a 2005, 6, 7 time scale, uh, we'll have to do things in parallel, such that if you have a failure in one test, you can in parallel go ahead with the second one. I, I understand what you're saying now, except what it implies is that, well, General Kaddish was saying uh, we're going to walk first and then we're going to try to run. What you're saying is even if we haven't learned how to walk, we're getting ready to, to become an Olympic sprinter. Um, it's kind of an interesting construction that you have there, because I think through all of this we need to, we need to explore the illogic that is laden heavily throughout all of these propositions advancing this system. Now, I wonder, uh, Mr. Coyle, is there, is there any maximum monetary threshold above which you would recommend that the NMD is not a cost-effective weapon system? Uh, I think that's a question for somebody else. Uh, I'm just a test person. Um, okay, well, let me ask it to someone else. General Kaddish, is there any maximum monetary threshold above which you would recommend that the NMD is not a cost-effective weapon system? In the program management business and development business, uh, Congressman, there's a, there's a balance between cost, schedule, risk, and uh, deploying and making weapon systems work. And that's an integrated process. Uh, basically, what I can do is provide you our best estimates. What's the maximum? Give, just give me a maximum number. Is it 60 billion, 100 billion, 200 billion? What, what would it be? I think, uh, again, I could provide estimates of well, what we think a particular just, program We're just here is. among friends. Give me a number. <laughs> <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Coyle. And that. Well, is there, there anyone here that has any numbers at all? Anyone? Yeah, you know, I have a, a, a document that was handed here, National Missile Defense Cost Estimate Increases 1996 to the year 2000. It started off, I think Mr. Tierney is the one that uh, was able to come up with this. It started out with an amount of 9 to 11 billion, and it's now at 50.5 billion. Now, you all remember that Star Wars took us into the stratosphere of spending on R&D for over $60 billion. We're now including all the estimated costs into the trophosphere fiscally of over $100 billion and more. I just wondered, General, is there any level of spending on NMD technology that could cause the Department of Defense to sacrifice procurement of, of other weapons, uh, paying for operations and maintenance of the aging and increasingly expensive arsenal of planes, ships, et cetera? As, um, as a taxpayer, we're all concerned, certainly I am, about what things cost and work Thank hard you. every day to do that uh, and make sure that the, we're proper stewards. Our current estimates 
for the program, which are under major revision now because of the President's decision, was in the neighborhood of a $20 billion acquisition cost, of which 5.7 has already been spent, and about a $32 billion life cycle cost for 20 years. Now, the CBO has done estimates and included more of the, of the system elements that we would have include, included, but it's of that magnitude that we currently have as an estimate. And as we go through the congressional appropriations process and the, the way we do our budgeting, it's for the Congress and the administration to decide whether that's adequate. Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I would like to submit for the record this attachment. Uh, how much time do I have? have another minute? Um, your time is, is over now, but you will have a, a significant amount of time in your follow-up. Okay, I just... Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm told um, that the decisions I make today will have impact 10 years from now, and that, that what we have today were made by members of Congress, Senate, the President 10 years earlier. And so it's hard for me kind of to visualize that word, world 10 years from now, but I do sure want to make sure I'm making the right decisions now. I had voted against deployment of SDI and GPALs. I had voted for research. Um, I represent, I guess, kind of in the middle here, my colleagues to my right uh, didn't vote for the National Missile Defense Act of 99. Um, and my colleagues on the, um, to my left, my other Republicans, probably voted for deployment earlier. Uh, but this is the law. It is the policy of the United States to deploy, as soon as technologically possible, an effective national missile defense system capable of defending the territory of the United States against limited missile, ballistic missile attack. Mr. Warner, I, I want to know if you uh, believe um, uh, that this is, in fact, the law. Yes, sir. It was signed by the President. Does it have your total support? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Kadish, General Kadish? Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Chair. Mr. Coyle? Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Boland? Um, yes, sir. I would only add that the President issued a statement at the time that made clear it. this was uh, in, uh, to be taken in the context of, um, of, of arms control developments and, um, and, the, and appropriations. I'm sorry, I don't have the the exact language, but, but I think the two things have to be seen together. That, that represents administration policy. Mr. Warner, um, is it your view that now it, it is not technically possible, but it will be? We have a program underway that we believe has made great progress, that has demonstrated the fundamental technologies, that in light of the recent testing difficulties and some other issues has, has greater schedule risk than we would have hoped. That is the date at which it must it would be available. Uh, but certainly it is our belief that we should, we should, as the President directed, continue the development to in fact see if we can meet the test that Remember, we talked about the four tests that the President has laid out. One of them is the one directly related to this law, and that is, is it technologically feasible? I believe for limited national missile defense, we as a nation can develop that capability and will be able to do so within the next several years. General Kadish? I would agree with that assessment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, at this point in time, we've been aggressively testing uh, the system that we have put together over the last 24 to 36 months. And we continue to do so. And as we continue to test it, we'll get more confidence in it. But uh, uh, we do have confidence we can move this system along within a very short period of time. Mr. Coyle? Mr. Chairman, uh, my job is to make sure that military equipment is adequately tested in realistic operational situations. It's not unusual for new military systems to do quite well in early technical testing, early developmental testing, and then have uh, great difficulty when they get to more realistic operational testing. I hear you there, but it, it's not a question of whether we're going to deploy, it's when, and the when depends in part on whether the technology is there. And my question is, do you believe, uh, you don't believe the technology is, is present, but do you believe it will be? As I said in my, in my testimony, 
uh, that's yet to be shown to be practicable. By that I meant able to be reduced to practice uh, so that you could depend on it in, in, in a realistic operational situation. And, and that's why I, I said it the way I did. And so my view is it's too early to tell and that we won't know the answer to your question until we get to operational testing. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back for a follow-up. Uh, Ms. Boland, I, I, I would uh, guess I, I'd still like to ask your opinion whether you think it will be technologically possible. Mr. Chairman, with due respect, I don't feel I'm the most competent person to, uh, to address that question. Fair I enough. defer to my colleagues. Fair I enough. would note that the President said in his speech last Friday that, that there is not sufficient information about the technical and operational effectiveness of an NMD system to move forward at that time. Uh, let me just say, that, Ms. Burton, I don't need to yield time because I'll give you full time to start as the chairman, and then we'll go to Mr. Tierney and so on. So you, you have time uh, to ask your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't take much time because, uh, I, first of all, I appreciate very much your, your uh, and Mr. Tierney, I'll be through here in just about one minute, so. But I really appreciate uh, you yielding to me. One of the things that uh, uh, staff has just brought to my attention, which really concerns me, is there is opposition to, uh, by some people in, in, in the Congress and in the country uh, for us building a missile defense system. But as I understand it, China in 1993 purchased from the uh, Russians uh, the S-300, which is a missile defense system, and they're currently negotiating to buy the Russian S-400 system. And our question is, uh, why would it be logical for us to accept the Chinese, who could potentially be a, a problem for us down the road, to build a missile defense system around Beijing when we uh, in the United States uh, can't or won't build a missile system? Does that seem logical to you? Um, Mr. Chairman, I will defer to my colleague, um, Mr. Warner, but I would, I would just note that I think the uh, we have a theater missile defense uh, system. I think the, the systems you were talking about fall in that, um, in that general, in well, that general range. The, uh, and, and we are permitted under the ABM treaty to have, um, to have a site which we have chosen not to, uh, not to exercise. But I'm not, I talking, would, about I the, I'm not talking about a theater missile defense system. I'm talking about a fully launched missile defense system states. The, the symbol, the point, the illustrations that you cited, the S-300 and S-400 are Russian theater missile defense systems. Mm -hmm. The Chinese, the Russians are, are enthusiastically seeking to merchandise those systems mm -hmm. and have been for the last decade or But we or have or. none around American cities or around any part of the continental United States. Uh, we have theater missile defense systems under development. Our general purpose, our explicit purpose for them is to deploy them to protect our troops in the field. But none around the United States are planned around the United States or any city. So, so what we could do is, is Beijing, around Beijing and around major cities in China, they can deploy a theater missile defense system like the S-300 or S-400, but around Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, uh, New York, we don't deploy a, miss, a theater missile defense system or any kind of a missile defense system, so they protect Beijing, Washington, D.C. is fair game. They protect Beijing against theater missile threats, shorter range missiles from somewhere near their territory. Would, they, would those theater defense missile systems be effective in any way against an ICBM? They would not. You're sure? Uh, we have looked at that very carefully. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Turner, you have five minutes. We'll roll it over for another five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me get back to uh, one issue that you brought up, Mr. Chairman, a little while ago about uh, what the policy is in this country. And, and we talked about the policy of uh, de deploying a system as soon as technologically possible. Uh, but I think the, uh, it also goes on to talk about an effective system. And the fact of the matter is if the system cannot be shown to be effective, then we perhaps shouldn't deploy it. And again, I get back to the issue of having confidence in the effectiveness. It's not enough to show that it works once or works twice. In order to have it do us any good at all, it's going to have to be shown that it works to such a degree that we can have confidence to employ it and uh, to deal with it as if it was going to work uh, sufficiently regularly to be effective. Also, the, uh, 
the whole policy is subject to the annual authorization of appropriations, so the Congress very much has something to say about where we go on this. In the Section 3, the third section of the legislation ought also be mentioned, which talks about the need to seek continued negotiated reductions in Russian nuclear forces. Uh, the idea being that now we have a conflict. It doesn't say how we're going to resolve the conflict, if there is one, that between uh, deploying the system and negotiating reductions, and we have to work and decide that. I think there are circumstances that we could see that would serve uh, to uh, actually encourage proliferation and undercut the effectiveness of the National Missile Defense System if we're not careful in how we proceed on this. So I think that uh, we have to be on record of discussing and considering all of those aspects in determination of whether or not we go forward. Mr. Coyle, maybe it would be helpful if you briefly discuss or describe what your office does and what your responsibilities are as the primary advisor to the Secretary of Defense on testing and evaluation issues. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, um, uh, my responsibility, the responsibility of my office is to oversee the testing programs uh, <coughs> that are conducted of military equipment uh, and in particular to be sure, as I said earlier, that they are adequately tested in realistic operational situations which can mean, you know, in the mud, in the rain, in the dirt, <clears throat> or against countermeasures, um, all of the things that can arise in real combat. Um, I approve the test and evaluation master plans that are uh, submitted by the military departments for each of these uh, testing programs. I approve the operational test plans when we get to that phase, when we get to operational tests, we're not there yet with national missile defense. Um, and I uh, report uh, to the Secretary uh, and to others, to the Congress as well, uh, on the results of such tests. So I think it would be fair to say that Congress created your position outside the weapons program offices to ensure that their testing and evaluation are up to par. That's correct. How would you rate the technological difficulty of this program in relation to other defense acquisition programs? Um, I, I think this is probably the hardest thing we've ever tried to do. Uh, this is more difficult than the, the F-22 uh, 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 fighter aircraft, uh, more difficult than the Comanche helicopter, uh, more difficult than any aircraft carrier or submarine or tank or truck that we've ever tried to, to build. With respect to the President's four criteria in deciding whether or not there's going to be deployment, how would you say the program is faring to date? I would say the progress to date is about what uh, I, I would have expected. Uh, what was difficult was that we faced a deployment uh, readiness review with the implications that are in the word deployment uh, when we were still very early and are still very early in the developmental test program. Well, you raised concerns, I think, of, in your role as director of uh, OT&E in 1999. Your report, for example, stated that undue pressure has been placed on the program and that test conditions do not suitably stress the system in a realistic enough manner to support acquisition decisions. Uh, did you also make a formal report during the deployment readiness review? I, I did, yes, sir. And what was your recommendation in that report? Uh, th that report pointed out the uh, the uh, limitations in the tests that uh, have uh, uh, occurred so far. Uh, much of that discussion is in my long statement for this hearing. Uh, uh, so that report pointed out uh, the limitations in the tests so far and uh, also pointed out the ways in which the tests uh, were not realistic, the ways in which the testing program had slipped, and other matters that I alluded to in my uh, short statement. And could you provide the subcommittee with that report? Uh, certainly. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that it uh, be accepted on the record. Right. Without objection. Okay. Um, in the context of the deployment readiness review, um, I have a hard time seeing how anyone examining the information could possibly make a decision to deploy uh, at this particular point in time, especially uh, when nowhere in the testing program are there flight tests against some very basic countermeasures or multiple warheads uh, and I think our intelligence agencies tell us that those will be the norm. Why isn't the Department of Defense listening? Or having read your report, why are they still going forward recommending deployment at this stage while it seems to me at least that your report was uh, very well founded on some logical 
uh, information. Uh, it might be better if General Kadish or uh, Mr. Warner an answered that question. Okay, well, General Kadish, can you tell me, having assuming that you've read uh, Mr. Coyle's report and assuming that all that he says in there is, is accurate, why is it the Department of Defense still made a recommendation to deploy when it seems fairly clear that it's, it's very, very premature at this point? The, I think it's uh, helpful to understand how the program is structured and the confusing, uh, confusion that surrounds this word deployment. What we have done and offered to uh, the Congress and the, and the President was to say that we have a, t a development program that's aggressively ongoing even today that is trying to bring this technology into the field. In order to meet a date early in this mid-decade, we have to back up from 2005, the date we established as uh, the earliest we could do this program, at the same time that we're developing it, and build the system at the same time we're testing it and designing it. That's the way national programs of, uh, of importance in a very short time have to be done so that you make decisions to move to the next build cycle in an incremental basis based on the results of your test. And that's the program we constructed. And this uh, thought of deployment is that is the decision to build the system. That could be done incrementally or it could be done all at once. But you take a risk in any military program when you design and build it at the same time. You need to do that, unfortunately, because of the way the world works, in order to meet a shorter time horizon for a program of this nature. If you want to do as Mr. Coyle suggests and wait until you're all finished the development do operational testing with real soldiers under realistic conditions, which we intend to do, and then build the system, then you have an automatic delay of at least four to five years before you can have a useful capability in the field. But so that's the thought, that's the, that's well, the Or under problem. your plan, General, we could build something that doesn't work and then we're really up the river, right? There, there in the plan that we have put forth, there were event-based milestones that checked our progress, and we just passed one of those, the DRR, if you will, that would check our progress, and the country could make a decision whether it was worthwhile to proceed. And we decided in this instance, at least, it's not yet. The, the president made his decision based on the information we provided. Well, based on the failures to date and the, and the other considerations that were there. I think there's some concern about the significant delay in various aspects of the program, General. Uh, but let's talk first about the booster. As I understand it, the flight tests are supposed to be integrated, right? And I, uh, they haven't yet used the launch vehicle that was intended for this system, right? That's correct. We never planned to do use that launch vehicle because we started the program very aggressively, and we used a surrogate booster for our first test. So it's not integrated to that extent? It is not integrated to that extent, and that was the way it was planned. But even the surrogate booster failed, is that right? in the IFT-5? That's correct. Now, the new booster is supposed to undergo its first boost vehicle test in February of this year, so the results could be factored into the deployment readiness review. But that test was de delayed, at least originally, until July, right? That's right. And now, subsequently, it's been uh, scheduled for when? Uh, right now, uh, early next year, in January, February time frame. We haven't really scheduled the test at this point in time. So this first booster was not, has not occurred. It's been delayed over a year, and it's not available for deployment readiness review at this point. Right. Mr. And Coyle, never planned to be so. Well, then it wasn't very integrated, I guess, is my point. Mr. Coyle, why is it important that the actual booster be tested with a system rather than a surrogate? Uh, the actual uh, booster uh, will subject the fuel vehicle on top of it to uh, faster speeds, higher speeds, and greater accelerations. And so you, we want to make sure that this very energetic uh, new booster doesn't, uh, in effect, hurt uh, the kill vehicle uh, when it's launched. Well, the third booster test, the one where you actually combine the booster and the kill vehicle, 
how far has that been delayed now? Uh, my recollection is uh, over a year. And I think, Mr. Coyle, you mentioned that an even greater impact might be felt with delays in the simulation and ground test facilities. Can you tell us what the LIDS system is and what it's supposed to do? Uh, it's a, uh, a, if you will, computer simulation system which allows various aspects to be of, the, of the overall system to be played, to be tried out uh, in simulation. And the use of this system, at least initially, was supposed to be available for the deployment readiness review? Uh, that's correct. And how long has the development of that system been delayed now? Uh, uh, again, my recollection is at least a year. Now, I, I think both of those were being developed by Boeing, is that right? Yes, sir. And, uh, General, is it true that you recently withheld uh, part of Boeing's bonus because of delays in the booster and the LIDS program? Uh, among other things, yes. And how um, much in dollar numbers uh, were they docked for that? Uh, I, I'd have to get back to you with the specific dollar amount, uh, if I could take that for the record, but it was about a 50% reduction. It's about $20 million? Uh, I believe that's the range. Okay. I'll get back to this. I guess we're going to be in trouble. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dage, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Kadish, I'm, I'm impressed with your testimony because as we move in this nation from a policy of mutual assured destruction to a policy of mutual assured survivor survivability, there is nothing more important that the military and the Congress can engage in in accomplishing that vision. And very often, the military, like members of Congress, catch an awful lot of flack. But I appreciate the perseverance that you have demonstrated. Um, perseverance is the key to America's survivability and to America being able to achieve peace through strength. And um, I appreciate your testimony very much. Um, I, I did want to uh, ask Ms. Bowen, the uh, administration, as, as you have testified to, has been <coughs> negotiating uh, with the Russians to amend uh, the ABM Treaty. Uh, th these attempts, uh, as we know, have been unsuccessful. And the Secretary of Defense also said that development and deployment of the boost phase intercept systems for national missile defense would not obviate the need to amend the ABM Treaty. I would like to direct this question to both you, Ms. Ms. Bolin, and Mr. Warner. My question is, what specific changes need to be made to the ABM Treaty to deploy the limited ground-based national missile defense system now planned? And that is to say, um, after it's been ratified by the United States Senate. Ms. Bowen. Um, thank you. Yes, I clearly, uh, at some point or another, deployment of the uh, National Missile Defense System, which has been under development and testing in this administration, would require changes to the to the ABM Treaty. As I uh, just to recall what I said in my statement, um, this would uh, the the specific elements of that are the deployment of an ABM radar at Shemya of 100 uh, ground-based interceptors and five upgraded early warning radars for the defense of all 50 states. This is just the, the C1 program would violate the obligations contained in Article I of the treaty not to deploy an ABM system of, to defend national territory. And these activities would, would also be inconsistent with the locational restrictions of Article III. Uh, what we have proposed to the Russians is a draft protocol to the treaty which would, in effect, uh, amend the treaty in such a way as to, um, to permit these, uh, these activities, to make them, render them not contrary to the treaty, while at the same time retaining the provisions of the treaty that underpin um, the, relation, the, the relationship between us of strategic stability. I think um, if I could take that a, a little bit farther and, and um, we, I'd be happy to, to, to talk with you further about the specifics. But I think what we're trying to do with the ABM Treaty is uh, to preserve those elements which we continue to think are valuable, which are those that define our strategic relationship with the Russians. I, I don't think uh, that, that um, 
even those who, who support a more robust national missile defense want, want to really take issue with that relationship of strategic stability. It is, um, it is very important in this post-Cold War world. We continue to have uh, large, uh, large nuclear arsenals, and we, we do not want to send a signal that we are trying to undercut the, the effectiveness of either country's uh, deference. So that is the core of the ABM treaty that we're, that we're trying to preserve. At the same time, it is clear that we have moved into a new strategic environment with a, with a threat that is coming from, um, from the ballistic missile potential of the countries of concern that we have talked about this morning. And, uh, and, and we need to be in a position to, uh, to respond to that threat. And it is, by the way, it is a threat that threatens not only the United States, but the, the Russians and our European allies as well. So our, our problem is not to throw the baby out with the, with the bathwater. We think the, the core of strategic stability that was at the, at the heart of the ABM Treaty is something good and something we want to preserve, but it needs to be adapted to, to new conditions. And that is the essence of the task that we've been trying to do in our discussions with the Russians over the last year. Thank you, Ms. Bolin. Uh, Mr. Warner. I'd like to uh, reinforce the, the last issue that uh, Ms. Bolin was just speaking about. Uh, we believe that, <clears throat> that mutual deterrence with Russia is still a very important dimension of our relationship in, in the world, and we want to sustain it. What we're really saying is that these are not mutually exclusive. We can, it can sustain mutual deterrence with Russia because the limited national missile defense system we would deploy, even in its two phases, is one that would not uh, threaten the Russian retaliatory deterrent. And that is different, and I'm just being clear, that's quite different than the vision that, for instance, President Reagan had in the 1980s. Uh, on the question of changes to the ABM Treaty, there was one additional element that came up as well. One of them was the question of covering the whole 50 states or national territory. That's banned by the treaty in Article I. We would have to amend that. Another one was location not in Grand Forks, which is currently what we've declared as our ABM area. Uh, there's also a technicality that the location of the X-band or ABM radar was going to be more widely separated from the interceptors. Even when we went to Alaska, we put the radar on Shimia, and we would plan to put the interceptors in central Alaska. So we needed relief not only being in Alaska, but in the separation between radar and interceptors. There was a third element, and that is we would upgrade five early warning radars, the three that were the classical ballistic missile early warning radars in Alaska, Greenland, and the United Kingdom, uh, and two that are in the United States, one in California and one in Massachusetts. We understand, and our plans would make those radars capable of helping affect an ABM intercept. That's different than the role they play today when they are just warning. So we also had to propose, and did in the proposed protocol, changes to Article 6 and Article 9 that would, under, that would anticipate that these early warning radars uh, could, in fact, play a role in ABM intercept engagements. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Um, Mr. Chairman, I guess our major concern, um, as, as I hear across America, is that we don't, we're, we're nervous the American people are nervous about an ABM treaty with Russia constraining <coughs> us from protecting the American people from a missile defense attack from rogue, rogue nations. And so that's why I really zeroed in on, on this particular <coughs> issue. And um, I don't want to get particularly political on you, Mr. Chairman, but I know as a woman that the number one issue that women are concerned about in America today is this issue. Um, I can tell you it's not a, a health issue. It is where will America be in 10 years? And, and uh, is our military providing for the defense of America? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. I thought you were going to ball me, ball me out for calling you Haig Chenoweth instead of Chenoweth Haig. Um, Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Coyle, uh, General Kadish said uh, a few moments ago that that in light of the President's decision, there'd have to be some reassessment of the, the projected cost of this program. And in your testimony, I may have heard him wrong, but 
I'll get, come back to that. In your testimony, you said you had some recommendations for additional uh, testing uh, to deal with some of the complexities that we're, we're talking about. And just to run through them quickly in your testimony, you said uh, there should be, uh, you said that target suites used in integrated flight tests need to incorporate challenging, unsophisticated countermeasures that have the potential to be used against the NMD C1 system, for example, tumbling RVs and non-spherical balloons. And you recommend use of the large balloon because it doesn't mimic in any way the current test RV, the reentry vehicle. The, the second, you said engagement times of day and solar position need to be planned to stress the acquisition and discrimination process by all the sensor bands, and you have to look at the effects of weather. Um, then you said, third, um, when, an, when an interceptor is launched against a target cluster before the RV is actually identified, uh, is resolved and discriminated against, you have to do some testing there. And then you said at least, uh, since it's not likely that only one missile would be fired by a state of concern that somehow believed it would, its cause, its interest would be advanced by firing missiles at the U.S., that you ought to do at least some engagement with, uh, with two, at least two incoming missiles. My question to you, uh, and you had another example as well, uh, have, does this mean some additional time and some additional cost in the program if you incorporate, if, if, if your recommendations are, ex are accepted? I'm not asking you how much, but... Uh, Yes, uh, General Kadish's office is is looking at the costs for these proposals, uh, b both the proposals that I've made and the General Welch's panel made, uh, and he perhaps should be the best to comment about about that. Uh, whether or not it would take additional time um, will depend on how you do it. And as I said earlier, if you do everything in series, certainly it will take longer, uh, which is why if the country intends to achieve uh, dates on the order of 2005 or 6 or 7, I would recommend that the testing program be done with more things happening in parallel. General Kadish, do you have a comment? We have taken um, Mr. Coyles as well as General Welsh and other recommendations internal to the program to enhance our ability to uh, test the system. Uh, we've taken those very seriously. They do cost money and in some cases a lot of money. And we are now in the process of trying to balance the, t the schedule, uh, cost, and technical risks associated with those. But I, I can assure you we're taking every one of those seriously and we will continue because as this program is in development phase, as long as we are allowed to continue, there will be more discoveries of things we ought to do that uh, that would make sense. So we are we're proceeding along those lines. Do you foresee at some future time, weeks or months in the future, that you would come back and say, we've rethought the system, here's a new schedule, here's a new estimate of cost? I mean, is that something you're planning to do? Yes, uh, Congressman. We're, uh, we, we do that uh, as a matter of course, and I insist on us always trying to improve what we're doing. And we're, we're looking very carefully at the way we're doing business now and where we'll make the acquired adjustments based on uh, what we see so far do, to make it, make it as uh, effective as we can. Do you have any date in mind in which you might? Yesterday was good for me, but uh, we, the process is a, is a comprehensive one. So it's going to take some weeks. And as we go, we will be talking to uh, Mr. Coyle, Dr. Gansler, and all the leadership in OSD. Great, thank you. I, I have uh, one, one other question. In, in looking at some of the press, this is more for you, Ms. Bowen, than, than anyone else, but in looking at some of the press reflecting the debate in the administration over what it takes, what would be, what work at Shemya would be a violation of the ABM Treaty, it sounded as if there were three interpretations, uh, depending in part on which agency, but also um, maybe crossing agencies. Uh, one, one interpretation that Mr. Cohen advanced 
was that the United States would not violate the treaty until workers had laid rails to, sh to support the Shemyar radar. The Shemyar radar. That's a move that wouldn't happen until 2002. I gather that another legal interpretation was that the United States would be in violation at the point when workers begin pouring concrete, uh, which would, was previously scheduled to occur in May. And a third interpretation was that the violation would not occur until the concrete foundation for the radar, radar site is complete, somewhere in, in between the, the two times. You know, if you look back at, at history, in 1983, we, the U.S. government, objected to the Soviets' construction of a large phased array radar near Kres Kresnoyarsk in Siberia. And the, radar, uh, the Reagan administration argued that that <coughs> radar was a violation of the ABM treaty. Uh, they said Kresnoyarsk was a symbol of Soviet duplicity. And in 1989, the Soviets admitted that that radar had been built at a location not permitted under the ABM and was a technical violation of the treaty, and they subsequently dismantled it. I mean, is, is the Department of State and the Pentagon as well taking a look at, uh, well, let, let, me, let me rephrase that. Are, has this dispute within the administration lawyers been resolved to your knowledge, or are, they, are there still these three interpretations of what would constitute a violation of the ABM treaty. Mr. Allen, at this point, I would say the question is moot because the, the president has, um, has decided not to proceed with, uh, with construction of the Shemya radar at, the, at this time. Um, there were a number of options which are, which are under review, but there was no decision made um, with respect to, to any of them. And at this moment, as I say, the question is moot. Um, when um, Secretary Cohen um, spoke, he was expressing um, his views on this. It was not, there, there is no administration position on this. W would you agree with me that the question will no longer be moot when another administration uh, is uh, confronted with the same issue? Of course, that I, I, I think your response is going to be that will depend on the state of our negotiations with the Russians. and I would accept that as well I, I think um, I think the question will certainly arise again and if the next administration decides to go forward with the with present present plans which include the the construction of the Shemya radar it will certainly arise to, uh, the point on timing and options is exactly as she said uh, we made clear of course if we, whatever the the Rubicon you cross where you have in fact begun construction we made no uh, we made clear to the Russians, we understand putting an ABM radar on Shimia is a violation of the treaty. So, I mean, a la Krasnoyarsk, we're not going through any uh, charade as they did for quite a time and sort of claim the radar that was coming in at Krasnoyarsk was not relevant. We, whatever the point is at which it might violate the treaty, we understand that a treaty violation will occur when you finally have this radar. Right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Kucinich. You, you have five minutes, and it will roll over for another five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, General Kaddish, um, do you believe that a nuclear war would have devastating consequences for all mankind? I believe any war has devastating consequences. What about a nuclear war? Of course. And do you think that uh, uh, effective measures to limit anti-ballistic missile systems would be a substantial factor in curbing the race in uh, strategic offensive arms and would lead to a decrease in the risk of outbreak of war involving nuclear weapons. Um, Congressman, uh, I'm a developer uh, of weapon systems and uh, I feel a little out of my lane to answer that type of question. Um, perhaps Mr. Warner <laughs> would, would tell you, and those are serious policy questions that uh, are out of my responsibility at this point in time. So what, what you're saying then is that all you do is build the weapons whether there's a war or not. What I'm saying is that I might have personal opinions about those issues, but in my official responsibilities, my, 
My primary responsibility is to develop uh, the missile defenses for this country, as directed. Thank you. The reason why I asked that question, I actually developed those two questions from the preface of the ABM Treaty. And so if we look at where all this started years ago, uh, in 1972, an ABM Treaty, the purpose of the ABM Treaty was specifically to limit anti-ballistic missile systems that would be a factor in curbing the race of strategic offensive arms and to lead to a decrease in the outbreak of war involving nuclear weapons. Now, I'd, I'd like to ask the administration's representative here, how does uh, the administration's position square with Article 5 of the treaty, which says that each party undertakes not to develop, test, or deploy ABM systems, et cetera? I mean, haven't you already violated the treaty? No, it, it is not our view that we've already violated the treaty. I think all the development and testing activities we've conducted, but I, I would defer to General Kadish and Mr. Coyle on that. Okay, on, then I would, on if, the general, if, if, if on, you, you, you haven't answered my question, then I want to go to Mr. Warner. Uh, Mr. Warner, I, I, I want to go to Mr. Warner with a, with a question here. You said that um, uh, according to the work on this treaty you're doing with the Russians, that you can have a shield that uh, would not threaten Russia's uh, retaliatory deterrence. Did you say that? I did. Okay. And uh, I just want to follow the logic of this. So we're t asking the American taxpayers to pay for a uh, missile shield that can be, by definition, penetrated by Russia. That is, in fact, the proposal, that, a limited national missile defense, not a comprehensive defense. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure that I understand what's being uh, advanced here. Uh, could, now, you, could we answer your Article I, 5 question? I, I, I have just five minutes, and you know, okay. we're, we'll have more time. Uh, I want to ask uh, General Kaddish a question. A as you know, uh, it's illegal to misuse the classification system to hide allegations of fraud or to reclassify previously unclassified information. That's Executive Order uh, 12958 at subsection 1.8a and 1.8c. Now, as you know, someone at the Department of Defense classified documents produced by Professor Postal of MIT that alleged that every uh, NMD test has failed and that, secondly, that there was considerable evidence that NMD contractor, TRW, had defrauded the government. Uh, why has the Department of Defense classified Professor Postal's allegations of fraud, and do you consider Department of Defense's classification of these allegations of fraud to be proper? We take all allegations of fraud very seriously, and we have aggressively, in my view, investigated them across uh, not only within our purview, uh, but also with outside agencies, including the Department of Justice. So, and that applies to beyond uh, Dr. Postal's uh, particular uh, allegations. In that particular case, I would, I would prefer to talk to you offline a little bit about the details, but I will say in general, the classification of Dr. Postal's information was not the allegations he made, but some of the information upon which it was based. So we need to discuss that further in a uh, closed session, but be glad to do that with you, Congressman. Um, well, you know, actually, General, with all due respect, it's been my experience that um, it's better to have these discussions in public. And, and my, I would... my, my only, uh, excuse me for interrupting, but my only comment along that line is not to, to uh, it gets into classified information. That's the reason well, why. Well, of course, but, but knowing that there's an executive order against classifying allegations of fraud, what steps are you taking to investigate whether the executive order was violated by Department of Defense employees? The department is taking steps uh, to look at those issues uh, across the broad front. It's been my, it's my understanding that the Department of Defense's Inspector General is not investigating, 
that he's waiting for a GAO report. Do you know anything contrary to that? Uh, as far as the DOD IG, I'm not specifically aware of any activity they are doing, but there, there is a GAO uh, look, at, look at it as well as other looks, as far as I know. So if there is reasonable grounds to conclude that there's been a violation of law regarding classification of allegations of fraud, would you refer, if you found that out, uh, a case to, an, to the Attorney General? To the proper authorities immediately. Sarah, pretty much. I'd like to uh, go to this issue of, of uh, states of concern, which uh, a few months ago were rogue nations, which a few months before that were terrorist states, which a few months before that may have been countries getting money from the United States. Um, which, which of the rogue nations you're getting ready to, uh, to defend against, General? Who are the rogue nations? The, the direction we have is North Korea. States Cor of concern. The direction we have in terms of the capability of the system is for North Korea and the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, possibly Libya. So if any of these nations become our friends in the next few years, will you disband the program? The, uh, the responsibility that I have is to continue the development program unless directed otherwise and possibly deploy. So I would defer that to a national decision. Sure. Now, if a, um, if a state of concern or a rogue nation or a previously unfriendly nation uh, intended to harm the United States, uh, which mode of weapon delivery is most likely? Um, for example, smuggling a suitcase of radioactive material and an ex explosive detonator in a commercial freighter to a U.S. port, uh, using uh, the most advanced or using the most advanced and expensive weapons technology to launch and successfully target a U.S. city with an intercontinental ballistic missile, which is most likely. I think the intelligence community, as well as the president, stated that the most likely might be other means of delivery. So you would say that the less expensive, less complex delivery method would be most likely? If the question is most likely. I would point out, however, that uh, there, there is a reason why countries develop ballistic missiles. And it's not to threaten only their neighbors. And, and how, would, how would the NMD protect against less complex, less expensive threats? I, I may defer to uh, Mr. Warner, but uh, from my point of view, uh, in the development phase, there are other means of protection this country has that even exist today for the terrorist threat. You can argue about how good those means are, but they do exist. In the case of ballistic missiles, there is no defense if one should be launched. So the country has to decide whether that is a worthwhile, even though unlikely, event to protect ourselves against. And according to what Mr. Warner said previously, if Russia, uh, we would look to a treaty where Russia would be able to have a retaliatory ability against our shield. I would just like to conclude with this thought uh, till we get to the next round. Um, when I sit in these hearings, I get a sense, with all due respect, because I know you're trying to serve the country the best you can, and you're not making the policy. Somebody's making the policy, though. If they're not in this room, someday they ought to be hauled before a congressional committee and, and made to account. But I, I get a feeling that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the development of a trailer for, a, uh, for the second uh, uh, version of, the, of Dr. Strangelove. Because what we're doing here is we're, we're really trying to condition the American people to accept a new climate of fear. And I have to say, that just as one American, one member of Congress here from Cleveland, Ohio, I don't like that. I think that uh, we can do better as a country in creating a world that 
believes that peace is possible and not that war is inevitable. And this idea that somehow that we will prepare for peace through spending tens of billions of dollars, Mr. Chairman, for, uh, for preparation for war, for war is, uh, is hard to take. I just have to mention that until I get my next uh, uh, opportunity to speak. Let, let me just say that I'm going to exercise my 10 minutes, and uh, then Mr. Turney has some questions he wants to ask, and, and then we do want to get on to the next panel. I appreciate the patience of the next panel. I'd like to... Uh, to touch on a number of issues, and I'm sorry we're jumping around a bit, but hopefully there'll be a sense of completeness to this. Uh, it's my sense that um, we've moved from SDI from, to GPALS to now uh, a, a system of national missile defense that is somewhat limited, uh, attempting to deal with rogue nations and maybe an errant missile from um, China or the Soviet Union. Um, it's also my understanding that, that the A BM Treaty under Article uh, 19, uh, under Article 14 uh, allows each party may propose amendments to this treaty. Amem uh, agreed amendments shall enter into force in accordance with the procedures governing the entry into the force of this treaty. So, I mean, w we wrote into the ABM the fact that we may someday want to amend it. It also allows each party shall, in exercising its national sovereignty, have the right to withdraw from this treaty if it decides that extraordinary events related to the subject matter of this treaty have jeopardized its supreme interest. This is Article 15. Um, so this is not, uh, while it is a, a significant uh, um, undertaking, it is certainly within the agreement of the ABM. And um, it is logical that members would be concerned about a national missile defense system uh, because the concept of ABM is deterrence. Uh, that logically one group would say, after your first strike, we can obliterate you, so you're not going to want to do the first strike. Uh, but there is obviously a concern with rogue nations. I, I like my colleague from Cleveland, fear the, the possibility of a nuclear weapon being literally brought in the trunk of a, of a car or the back of a truck or, or, or put on a ship and brought to port in the United States and detonated, or chemical weapons. I mean, those are possibilities. But I, I also fear that... Ten years from now, I would have voted against a limited national defense and a missile's on its way. And I think to myself, what kind of decision did I make today? And obviously, costs are a factor in destabilization. But uh, I, I'd love to, to just understand what it takes to get the Russians to sit down. And it would seem to me that one of the things it might take to get them to sit down, to realize they may have a benefit in this, since it is a limited national missile defense, is for us to have moved forward uh, with the radar in Alaska. Um, and, and I would like to know, um, why did the President decide not to move forward with the radar since the technology is clearly, I think, there to move forward? And, and maybe um, i just throw it open to the floor. I'd, I'd, I'd like that explained to me. Well, as he announced it in his speech a week ago at Georgetown, uh, the main factor was to him that there were now questions about the technical feasibility. He didn't. He wanted the development program to go but ahead. Not of, not of the radar. No, no, but of the overall system. That Correct. those tended to, in his view, shove the initial operating capability out a year. He spoke of now it was it was capable of now being fielded in 06 or 07. And given the fact that now that this deployment would probably be a year later, there was not the same pressure to get the radar construction underway that there would have been if you were trying to make 05. I'll follow that up, but Mr. Uh, General Kadish, do you have a comment? Mr. Coyle? Uh, I, I, About I, I, the radar itself. Is the, the radar technologically there? I think you have to look at this as an entire system, and we've tried to evaluate it as an entire system right. in the process. We'll do that after you answer my question, if you would. Is the radar has progressed very well in the overall testing. It's probably uh, one of the, one of the uh, better elements in terms of our expectations. Mr. Coyle? I would agree with that. Right. So there was really no technological reason why we needed to wait on the radar. Now you wanted to make your point that we need to look at this as a whole. but. Uh, Ms. Ms. Bolin, isn't it true that if we uh, moved forward, we would be calling the question, which the Russians seem to be forcing us to do? Are they sitting down with us? They, 
they are sitting down with us, Mr. Chairman, and as I indicated earlier, I think we, we have made some progress, not as much, obviously, as we, as we hoped, but uh, in the sense that they now uh, accept that there is a threat. This was um, stated clearly in the, in the joint statement of the two presidents at the Moscow summit in, in June. There was absolutely explicit recognition that there is a, uh, a threat out there of missile proliferation and that it poses a threat to, to international um, stability. Um, the Russians are seized with the issue. I think um, uh, they will certainly look at the, at the totality of the system um, and uh, they will look at what the, what the next administration does on this. But a vote, by a vote of 317, for it, Congress and the President signed into law the fact that we will have a national missile defense system. Uh, that's going forward. Now, it is subject, obviously, to annual appropriations of Congress. But I, I thought we got beyond the issue of whether, and the question is when. And so it would strike me that uh, we had a viable part of the system that we could begin to implement uh, and that there would be a positive side effect to that, and that would simply be to force the, the, the Russians to know we're serious. I don't think they think we're serious. I think they think that we're going to back off. And as far as our allies not being for the system, I don't think they fear what we fear. And I think they may have a reason not to fear it, but we have a reason to fear it. We think those missiles will be directed at us, not them. Well, I would say about the, the, the allies, certainly um, the, the threat in time is, um, is more immediate for them, the threat from the, from the Middle East. And uh, I think we have um, gotten their attention on this issue. There are many concerns out there, as you, as you know, they are concerned about the, uh, what happens if we can't get the Russians to agree to amend the ABM Treaty. They are concerned about what this does to strategic stability. They are concerned about decoupling. They are, they are concerned about what steps they should take to, to protect themselves. So I, I think um, this gives us more time to pursue that dialogue. And I, I think it's very my, my, important my fear, that, we, that we have the Allied support. Uh, my, my, my fear is that, that it will uh, convince them that we're not serious. I mean, we had one part of the program we could be, begin to implement that we know works. And, and, and we decided not to. Um, and, and I still am wondering why. And maybe one of you could tell me why we needed to stop there when we could have begun to, to, uh, to, um, to build it. Well, I think as Mr. Warner just said, we would not, the, the delay I'll in the Mr. radar Warner will. Say it. Why, Mr. Warner, why, why, I, I'm, not, I'm not hearing it. We if the overall system. system is not going to be available till 06, and we think that there is a uh, you know, challenging but uh, achievable path to build the radar on Shimia, operationally test it, and have it ready in about four years, then you can delay the beginning of that whole construction until the summer the spring I, summer of 02 instead of the spring summer of 01. I know you can do that. I'm just wondering why we're doing uh, it. I'm, I'm just saying the context was that if you, that it, if you're if there was no pressure to get started, why take that step now? Uh, the well, Russians are clearly waiting for the new president. There's no doubt about that. They were going to do. They began to signal that, in my view, to us in our talks with them, uh, certainly by the spring of this year, if not early. I mean, they know there's an election coming. They, are, they know that this, the legacy of whatever this president had done would be subject to review with, uh, by the next president. So in a sense, we could never escape from the fact that there was going to be a new occupant of the White House. And the Russians, in a sense, said, uh, once we've looked at the balance of all this, we'll wait and see who that is and what he wants to do. And that, to my view, is where we stand on the question. And the Russians. Uh, we're willing to do some things in the interim. They did, in fact, acknowledge the threat. They've, they've joined us in a series of cooperative activities, an agreement signed in New York just two days ago. But on the whole, they're saying, 
will wait and deal with the next administration. Right. But the test, your testimony still stands that, that the technology exists now that we could have moved forward. I, my, I want to clarify that. I, my general, my personal judgment is that overall we will be successful, but it will have to be demonstrated. In that sense, I mean, I completely agree with, with Mr. Coyle. I think we have the fundamentals to do the job, but I can't say we've yet fully, no, I'm, fully I'm demonstrated. Talking about, I'm talking about the radar. The oh, I'm sorry about the, the radar. The radar is the radar is in we believe is has come along very well to do the task we ask of it. I just want the record to show that there's no technological reason not to move forward with the radar. That was not cited by the president as one of the issues that he, he that he took into consideration any difficulty with the radar. Thank you. I'm going to uh, yield to the rank, not yield, but uh, give the ranking member. Oh, excuse me. Could I, would the gentleman mind if I just yield? Did you have one question that you wanted I, to I do. I have a, um, a comment, Mr. Chairman, that I would like to make for the Ms. record. Chenoweth. In response to Mr. Kucinich's uh, question, I think it was a very interesting and probing question about terrorism versus a realistic attack of an ICBM. Um, and in, in making my statement, I, I would like to enter for to the record officially uh, an article entitled Facing the Risks, a Realistic Look at Missile Defense by John Train, who has been appointed um, uh, as a contributing editor of Strategic Review and has received appointments from Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. And uh, to sum up his testimony, he answers Mr. Kucinich's question. Uh, he said the administration may settle for a shallow and vulnerable missile defense that might not bother the Russians or some of the potential aggressors it's supposed to protect us from. A fanatic can attack the U.S. using other weapons, notably biological and chemical, against which we must defend ourselves. But many unstable countries are also at great expense building missiles that can hit the U.S. in coming years. One reason to erect defenses is to reduce the temptation for their use. He concludes by saying we are likely to be attacked at our weakest point and should leave no inviting apertures. Um, I think that sums it up, especially in view of the fact that we know Nor North Korea is spending far more money on building a missile defense system than they are feeding their starving people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, we'll put that on the record. And uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, let me just uh, pick up a little bit on the cost, if I can, uh, for, for a second. As I understand it, this program started with an estimate of around 9 to $11 billion. Uh, I have a CRS report that tells us the estimate in January of 99 was $10.6 billion. Uh, yet then CRS uh, said that by February of 2000, about a year later, this estimate rose to $26.6 billion. What caused that sharp increase? The when you're dealing with cost estimates, you have to define the time period and the elements that are included in the cost. Well, this was from 90, 1999 when it was 10.6 billion to February of 2000 when it was 26.6 billion. So I think we're asking what elements or what things changed to get that increase. So the, I would probably be better off if we did this in uh, response to the record, but just in general, what I would say is that the 20 uh, billion dollar figures that include 5.7 billion dollars from 1991 to the present as well as what our best estimate at the time of what the ground-based system the NMD system was going to take to build that gets you to about a 20 billion dollar figure now those elements are of course under review right now based on the decisions that uh, have been taken but that and I would like to be more specific for the record to make sure that we line up what the CBO and the CRS say versus what, uh, what our estimate is. Because the time horizons, and, uh, horizons as well as the elements are very important in there. Well, it jumped up that much by February 2000, but the CBO in April of, that, of 2000 said it was going to be $29.5 billion. And then the CBO, uh, and then the JOA, JAO rather, GAO, in May of 2000, said it was going to be $36.2 billion. So, I mean, all these figures just keep jumping. Right. And, part, and a large part of the reason for the what 
is implied as massive changes in the cost estimate, significant changes, is because we added missiles. The original cost estimate, as I recall, that we did was for 20 missiles in 05, and that was it, our so-called C-1 capability. But when we went to the expanded C-1, where there was 100 missiles by 07 under the old program, then the cost estimates, of course, had to be included for those new missiles that we added to the program. Well, GAO says that added about $2 billion. Would that be about right? Uh, I, 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 about $2 billion is about the number I remember for a large part of the missiles, right? So that still leaves a significant jump from $10.6 billion to $26.6 billion on that. Is, do you have some idea what the rest of that was all about? Again, I would, I would like to be able to line those up in a more disciplined manner to show you comparisons than I can here in testimony. Well, more recently, as you went into the deployment readiness review, your office was charged with evaluating the program as it stood in July or perhaps August of this year. Uh, I think you came up with a new cost estimate for the DRR of $40.3 billion, right? There were a range of cost estimates done, not only by us, but by uh, independent estimators within the department. But yours was 40.3 40, 40 billion, right? Yeah. The, the actual number, I, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it, but it was around, around the 36 well, life give, cycle cost was about 36, as I recall. If I give you a copy of your uh, National Missile Defense Review Agenda, your internal document, would that help you? Um, Because that has it at 40.3 billion. <coughs> All right. If you take the uh, cost comparison that we did, the FIDEP or the, the Future Years Defense Program, the acquisition cost, total acquisition cost, and put it from 01 to 28, from fiscal year 01 to fiscal year 28 in then year dollars, which means fully inflation adjusted. If you add an additional 5.7 from the earlier time frame from 91, which then gets you from 91 to 28, it's 40.3. And that's the number you came up with in your internal that's review. That's right. Okay. But the cost analysis improvement group, can you tell us who they are? They are an independent uh, cost estimating agency within the Department of Defense. Right, and they came up with $43.2 billion, right? They came up with about a billion dollars more than what we did. Well, they came to $43.2 billion. That's a little more than a billion more. Well, I guess I'm talking about the acquisition cost. Okay. So if we, if we were to take their number, we're at $43 billion. And I understand there are other costs that aren't included in those estimates. Uh, one of them being the operational requirements document, interoperability requirements. Those aren't in your numbers, am I right? We did a full well, I, I, cost I, estimate. As much as I'd like to hear the explanation, I don't think it's either it was or it wasn't. Was, it, was that in your number, the interoperability? Is, yes, it was. So that's in your $40.3 billion? Yes. Okay. I don't, as I read your internal document, it does, does not reflect that it is, but that's fine. How about Mr. Welch's adjustments? Uh, we, we did our best estimate of what they, those elements would cost, and those uh, are in our estimates as of this time. But all, the, all these estimates are under review uh, based on what uh, the President's decision is, and we need to do an awful lot of work to make sure that we get the best estimate we can of the program. Does your figure also include the alternative booster program costs? No. And that's another billion dollars or so? Should we decide to do that? That decision has not been taken. And does it include restructuring of the program to remedy any testing delays? Uh, no. Okay. Well, let me, let me make sure I get that question right. For the test delays, yes. Okay. For the additional time required in an extension of the program, no. Well, with the regard to the extension program, Mr. Coyle, you provided a, uh, on page five of your testimony, you had a figure two that showed the, uh, graphically, I think, the slips in the flight test, the booster test, and the LIDS that you identified earlier in that development. 
You also provided a general estimate of the range of slippage. I think basically the program is losing ground at the rate of 20 months every three years. Is that yes, sir. That's correct. correct. And if you extend that out, uh, by what date would the program be able to field all 100 interceptors? Yeah, if, if the program were to continue to slip at the current rate, uh, it would extend the date another couple, two and a half years. So you had 100 interceptors due 2007, and then that, that's seven years, 20 months at, uh, for every three years would be 47 months. It's about four years delay, right? Yes. So actually 2007 becomes 2011. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, GAO reported that the program costs increased by $124 million every month the program slips. So by your calculation, that would add about another $5.8 billion, right? Arithmetic sounds right to me. Well, I did it in advance just to make sure, because it's not my strong suit. <laughs> okay. All right. so let me just finish up here then. Uh, Ms. Bowen, the State Department has obviously been conducting negotiations on the system. and. If we just disregarded the concerns of our NATO allies, as some people have proposed, uh, and that would abrogate the ABM treaty, is it likely that England and Denmark would allow us a place to forward deploy our radar sites? I think that's a very real question, Mr. Tierney. But in all likelihood, they wouldn't if we just went against their wishes and disregarded. I think we, we can't absolutely say because you can't predict the circumstances under which this might happen. But it's a pretty good bet. But, uh, but we cannot take it for granted that we would have the, uh, the permission either to, to upgrade the, um, the early warning radars that we're talking about for the present system or um, building the um, expand radars that we want for a later, later phase. And without them, we, certainly that prevents us from being able to field the kind of proposed missile defense system that we're envisioning. Well, I would defer to, um, to General Kadish and Mr. Coyle on that, whether there are alternatives. Well, Mr. Coyle, if, if we didn't have the uh, support in England and Denmark, didn't allow us to place our forward deployed radar sites on their territory, would that pretty much uh, do away with our ability to field the system as it's currently envisioned? Uh, perhaps there would be some other alternative. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bolin, I have a, seen a copy of an article from Jane's Intelligence Review that quotes several top-level Russian officials. One is the Defense Minister Igor Sergeyev who declares that Russia must develop new weapons capable of neutralizing any United States ABM system. Another, Major General Vladimir Dvorkin, director of the Russian Defense Ministry's Central Research Institute, suggests that Russia could redeploy its rail mobile ICBMs if our defense system goes ahead. So I think that people argue a little simplistically that while Russia shouldn't have a veto over United States defense policy, I think we would all agree on that, but don't you think that those statements or statements like that should at least let us know that our actions have potential repercussions and that we should at least take them into account? I, assume I, the I would that. certainly agree that our, that our um, actions will have potential repercussions. What the Russians might do in reality if a future president decided to withdraw from the ABM treaty, again, it would depend very much on the, on the circumstances. And um, I hark back to what was said um, earlier, uh, what, what Mr. Warner said, I think um, um, the Russians realize that, they're, that they will have to face up to the, to the problem, and uh, I think they're, they're waiting for a new administration to see exactly what the dimensions of the, of the issue will be and what they, um, what they will have to negotiate um, on. But I think we would certainly not want to minimize the consequences if uh, if, if we were to, to withdraw from the ABM treaty, and I think that was certainly a factor that weighed in the President's decision. Thank you. Uh, General, let me just say, I, I, isn't it fairly accurate? The 1999 National Intelligence Estimate uh, said that one potential effect of our deploying a national missile defense system in violation of the ABA, ABM treaty would be for Russia or China to actually sell sophisticated countermeasures uh, to other countries. Isn't that a, a real potential? that even though some of these so-called rogue nations may not have sophisticated countermeasures at present, that they could be purchased on the market from a ready that's, seller at some point. Part of a That'll be part of a proliferation regime, obviously. And, uh, and the, the challenge, however, even if countermeasures are sold, uh, we have the ability to go through our C3, our upgrade of the system, to handle that. And I would, I would assert that just getting countermeasures 
is not enough. They have to integrate them into the total weapon system that they have. And that is not a trivial challenge. All right. I I'll let you go on that because the chairman wants to move along. But I have a problem with the idea that we always assume that it's going to be too difficult for the rogue nations to have a missile system, uh, for to have countermeasures, but not too difficult for them to have missiles. We don't assume it be too difficult. We assume that we can handle them based on our system design. Which we don't provide for testing on. But thank you. Yes, that. Okay. Um, I thank all four of you. I'm, I'm, I'd welcome you each to make a closing remark if you'd like to, just uh, if you have any comments to make. You have been very patient with this committee and appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to getting to the next panel. Thank you very much. Our next panel is the Honorable Lawrence uh, J. Korb, Vice President and Director of Studies, Council on Foreign Relations, Dr. Elizabeth Grunlin, Senior Staff Scientist, Arms Control Program, Union of Concerned Scientists, Dr. William Graham, Chairman and President, National Security Research, Inc., and Dr. Kim Holmes, Vice President and Director, the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute, the Heritage Foundation. I uh, uh, welcome you all to stand so I can swear you in. Can I get you? No, no, no we're going to swear you in, Mr. Court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you took my hand signal, huh? We're waiting for four. You don't have to put your hand up yet. You're like me here. You're eager. I hope we have four witnesses. Oh, do we have some? Excuse me here. Brunlin, Graham. Are we? We need a chair here. We're going to keep your hands down a sec. We're going to get you settled here. Sorry. And we may mo slide a little bit to your right, just a little bit, so we can thank you. You're not that much, uh, Mr. Spring. I think we are, I think. Uh, Jason, would you get another chair? Does that fit in? That fits in all right? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. If you would raise your right hand, thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? No, for the record, uh, all our witnesses are responding the affirmative. Have I left out a witness here? Uh, Spring is, uh, Mr. Spring is a company. Okay, I'm sorry, I should have pointed out Mr. Uh, Baker Spring, a research fellow, is with the Heritage Foundation. And Mr. Spring, you're welcome to respond to questions as well. Uh, maybe we could slide in a little bit to get you into this group a little bit. Just a spec. Here, we're set. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Korb, you're going to start out. I, I, I think it's... Uh, I think you realize that you've waited a while and appreciate you being here. Yes, Mr. Dr. Graham. Uh, yeah. I, uh, you have a time for I have a, a concern that with my schedule, I had originally been told I would be uh, able to leave by noon. Let I've, me ask you this. Uh, I've you deferred my schedule to 1245, but I have a hard cutoff. Well, we're we're going to accommodate you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Corb will be happy to accommodate you, correct? Or you have a problem, too? I do, too, but, you know, <laughs> so I was told we'd be out by well, noon. Well, you know what? Uh, that's what we thought. Let me ask you, do, do you have a flight or do we have a flight here? Do you want to negotiate between the two of you and, and we'll just... Yeah. Dr. Graham will go and if you keep it to five maybe and we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll go as quickly as I can and then, then I must excuse myself. I understand. I apologize. Uh, uh, I've been asked to <clears throat> testify on the test failures, technology development and EBM treaty provisions. Let me say by way of background that I believe both General Kadish and Dr. Coyle are exceptionally able individuals. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not here to defend the current program. I believe it based on an assertion by Dr. William Perry when he was Secretary of Defense that if the U.S. ever needed a, ballistic, a national ballistic missile defense system, the country could take three years to develop it and three years to deploy it, the infamous 3 plus 3 system. I could find no substance to that plan when it was proposed by Dr. Perry and none now. I believe it was probably designed to respond to congressional critics of the lack of any NMD program by the administration in the mid-90s. And they're now struggling with a 3 plus 5 variant of that program and uh, their testimony is evidence to that struggle. Is there a need for ballistic missile defense? I served as a commissioner on the commission to assess the ballistic missile threat to the U.S., the Rumsfeld Commission, 
Uh, it found its findings were very different from those put forward by the intelligence community at that time, and I believe they're well enough known uh, that I won't go into those. Although I believe the testimony did show, for example, that China is building <clears throat> new land-based and submarine-based ballistic missiles. Iran uh, is building ballistic missiles, North Korea, uh, Syria, Libya, and probably Iraq as well. Uh, some believe that these uh, uh, ballistic missile developments by countries potentially hostile to the U.S. can best be handled by nuclear deterrence, arms control, and diplomatic means. The problem with this approach is that it has been practiced for decades and has led to a current world situation where both missile and weapon of mass de destruction, nuclear, chemical, biological threats, continue to grow and proliferate. This, in turn, gives rise to potential situations where deterrence, as we traditionally understand it, may no longer be effective. The answer to a failing policy is not more of the same, but the formulation of a new policy. With nuclear deterrence, uh, while nuclear deterrence and diplomacy will continue to play an important role in U.S. counterproliferation policy, missile defenses and other military measures will strengthen U.S. counterproliferation policy providing substance and therefore diplomatic leverage. Arguments to the effect that U.S. development and deployment of ballistic missile defense systems will trigger a new arms race are specious in view of the fact that the proliferating nations are already racing at full speed. What we must now do is try to counter that growing threat. <clears throat> Let me address technical feasibility for a moment. Uh, many have questioned the, the feasibility and the testing methodology of the ballistic missile uh, defense systems. This is especially the case with the national defense rather than the theater defense systems, since I believe as a result of U.S. coalition and Israeli experience of being attacked by ballistic missiles during the Gulf War, the need for theater missile defenses is now widely understood and accepted. Uh, the technical feasibility can be addressed from the vantage points of both uh, U.S. experience and technology. And uh, I'll summarize this very quickly, but I will say that, that the purpose of testing, uh, such as Dr. Coyle uh, accurately described, is several fold. But the earliest part, the developmental testing, is to try to validate and improve the models that are used in the development of the system and to detect and compensate for any uh, items or or characteristics that were overlooked in the development of the models. You would expect and look for failures of the models and to some degree failures in the tests during that time. Uh, in fact, an insistence on low risk early successes in the development, developmental testing, I believe, poses a severe threat to U.S. leadership in the development of advanced technology in general and cutting edge, te edge technology weapon systems in particular. Uh, this was a matter of direct concern to me when I was a science advisor to the president and one I've had a continuing interest in. Systems that are required to be low risk from the outset must avoid the introduction of new and frequently untested technologies. Since the development and introduction of new technologies is in fact America's song, strong suit and one we have invested a great deal of money in, insisting on low risk complete early test success is tantamount to giving up much of the strong unique advantage that the U.S. Has, has acquired through its enormous investment in science and technology. The time to hold weapon systems to a high standard of test success is in the late phases of engineering development and especially in operational test and evaluation. By this time, the problems encountered in the system development should have been worked out. The system should be ready for deployment. I believe Dr. Coyle's testimony, in fact, in reality, has pointed out that the administration has substantially underfunded operational tests and evaluation assets and capability for national missile defense systems, and that that underfunding and under support should be rectified. On the other hand, uh, while it isn't surprising there have been failures to date, there is an unusual disturbing aspect to the failures encountered so far. In most cases, they have not occurred in the new cutting-edge technology aspects of systems tested, but rather in technologies that were developed decades ago 
and are now well understood features of rocket and missile design. The failures to date are typical of those caused by a lack of systems integration experience rather than uh, a lack of knowledge of missile and rocket design and may be related to several characteristics of the defense industrial base today. These include rapid downsizing of the defense industry over the last decade, the small number of new systems that have been developed during that time period, the absence of new systems being produced, deployed and operated for several decades in the ballistic missile defense area, particularly national missile defense, and the inability of the defense industry to attract new technical talent and mentor its technical workforce in the face of strong economic competition from the high technology commercial sector. The U.S. is learning once again that engineering, programmatic, and operational experience is a difficult and expensive capability to acquire and an easy capability to lose. Nonetheless, as I sum summarize in the... Yes? Doc, if, how much more do you have? I'm about, just uh, conscious of Dr. Korb as well. Right. Yeah. About uh, two or three minutes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and I'm just going to let you get on your way afterwards. Uh, All right. So. Thank you. I've, I've given my paper both uh, a table of 15 different programs that experience, which are typical of high-tech missile and, and uh, rocket-based programs that experienced a great deal of difficulty in the first stage and since then have become uh, some of our most successful systems. Uh, I would also like to point out that the hardest part of the way we do ballistic missile defense is the hit-to-kill aspect, one the Russians don't deal with because they use nuclear warheads on their interceptors in their Moscow defense system and also on their S-300 and S-400 systems um, uh, that they have deployed in the, around other parts of their country. Uh, however, something like 80% of the time that we've gotten our hit-to-kill technology in the terminal homing phase, it has actually proved to be successful. I think that's actually a, a remarkably good record. I give in my paper several, uh, a, a whole list, in fact, of uh, places where the ABM treaty is interfering with or compromising the development of our ballistic missile uh, defense system. Uh, I would point out that, uh, that in addition to the treaty now having been substantially violated by the Soviet Union, as was discussed earlier, and being a unilateral constraint on the U.S., it is in fact playing a major role in limiting what we can do. Many of the criticisms of the current system's performance can be traced back to ABM treaty limitations. I give those in my paper, but I won't take the time to go over them uh, in, in the testimony. Uh, and uh, finally, I'd like to say that a system design that would be effective uh, would be different from the current system design. It would be a multi-layer ballistic missile system uh, design. It would involve ground-based components, sea-based, air-based, and in the foreseeable future, space-based components. Virtually all of those are ruled out by the, by the ABM treaty. Uh, uh, but in fact, uh, uh, with the ability to develop the full range of ballistic missile defense aspects and take advantage of the fact that we have the world's best uh, instrumentation for uh, observing foreign missile tests and therefore know today and will know in the future much more about the real world performance of their countermeasures than they will know uh, and be able to adapt to those when they test their countermeasures. If not before, I have no concern with our ability to overcome their countermeasures program. Uh, but I believe a foreign country deploying a countermeasure against us should have a real worry that we will know more about his countermeasure and its, and its actual performance based on our ground, sea, air, and space-based sensors than he will have about the performance. And this doesn't often come up in the discussion, but it's a very real worry to any potentially uh, hostile country. Uh, so I don't believe the countermeasures uh, is, a, is a limiting factor on what we can deal with. I believe it's a serious concern. I always have. I believe we should deal with it. Uh, we are dealing with it. We had an extensive uh, experiment called MSX, uh, in which we put a satellite on orbit with an, a large array of sensors, fielded a large number of countermeasures against it, 
not just a few, but a large number, not just simple, but very sophisticated. We have the data on that. No one else does. So I'd like to say in, in conclusion that if the U.S. were to carry forward a national program drawing on our best capability from all of industry, not just from one contractor or a contractor and a few subcontractors, but all of our capability, and had the, had the uh, constraint of the ABM treaty lifted from us, uh, I have no doubt that we could develop an effective ballistic missile defense system, and it would, it would tend to discourage and deter other countries from building ballistic missiles rather than encouraging them to build them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for having to excuse myself. Well, I understand you told the uh, committee uh, staff that you did have to leave. I just didn't get relayed to me. I'm sorry. Thank um, you. Thank you for staying. Uh, Dr. Corb, thank you for your patience. I have a statement I'd like to be part of the record. I'll just make a... Can you put the call. mic in front of you? These mics are, have a... I'll, I'll make a... Is it, is it on? Maybe it's, it's on. I'll make a, a, few, a, few, a few comments. Uh, first of all, I'd like to commend you for holding this hearing, and I think the testimony, particularly of Mr. Coyle, earlier demonstrates the wisdom of Congress in setting up that separate office of test and evaluation. My testimony was prepared before President Clinton's decision, but I do support that decision as a victory for common sense, given the technological and diplomatic uh, problems that we were having with the system. I point out in my testimony, the system we're talking about today has five components. All, to a certain extent, are pushing the technological frontiers, and all must work all of the time in order for this to, uh, to, be, to be effective. And I'd also like to uh, point out uh, that uh, this system, two of the five phased array radars, as was pointed out by uh, Congressman Tierney, are in other countries. And they're not going to let you do it. I mean, Ms. Bolden, I think, was quite diplomatic. But the fact of the matter is Greenland and Britain have said they will not let you do it, uh, put the, uh, put, uh, increase the power of those phased array radars uh, if, if you violate ABM. In terms of technological challenges, uh, people always point out, well, we did the Manhattan Project, we did the ICBM, we went to the moon. But the fact of the matter is nobody was defending the moon when we went there. This is a much greater technological uh, challenge. And I'm sure with enough time and money, we could get uh, a system that's 85 percent effective with a 95 percent confidence rate, which is my colleague Dick Garwin who worked on the hydrogen bomb and was a member of the Rumsfeld Commission, points out it's really what you need with this system. This is not just any system. It's got to work, and it's got to work well uh, when you when use it. I'm, I'm sure that with enough time and money, we could hit a high-speed warhead in outer space under controlled circumstances. But that's not what we're doing. We have a concurrent weapons uh, development program, and the last one I was involved in was called B-1. When I was in government, that darn thing still doesn't work because we, uh, we, we, rushed, we rushed that. And it has not really been tested, in my view, against realistic, uh, in realistic uh, uh, bat, uh, battle, battle, battle environment. Again, my colleague Dick Garwin points out that uh, in order to be confident that the system would work, you'd need 20 successes. If you have three failures, then you need 47 successes, and we're nowhere near that. Uh, and I noticed that every time one system doesn't work, then people come up with another system. I've been around to live through Excalibur, brilliant eyes, brilliant pebbles, and now I hear people talking about new, more robust systems. I recently debated uh, former CIA director Jim Woolsey on boost phase. Well, I got to tell you that if you're going to go to that, you're going to need a new, more advanced interceptor, as well as a more sophisticated radar and command systems, and you're going to have to test that as we should, and in my view, to take five to seven uh, years. And again, when people talk about more robust and layered system, they know the devil is in the details. I think it's important to find out what it's specifically uh, they're talking about. Uh, people are saying, well, it doesn't have to be that reliable. Uh, and again, this is not just any, any system. And don't forget that we've spent $100 billion already and we have nothing. And I have no guarantee that we could spend another $100 billion before having something that's technologically uh, what, what we need. Uh, the ABM treaty is still valid. President Bush was the one who wanted to make the Russians a Soviet success of state. In fact, Secretary Baker demanded that they do, and the president made, uh, made, 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 made the statement. So if you want to if you want to go against it, you're going to have to modify it. It still is in effect. And in fact, Congress in, in, in 1996, basically, by talking about con uh, 
modifications to ABM implicitly recognized that the Russians were the Soviet, were the successor state. Um, and then finally, I'd like to quote a man who had the privilege of serving for five years, President Reagan. When he came up with this, he dictated no t timetable and uh, did not uh, prejudge any specific technology. Thank you. I have just come to the conclusion that if you want to change a bland statement to one that's quite forceful, just keep the person waiting a while. <laughs> your, your statement uh, is said almost in tongues compared to the way you spoke just this past few minutes. What kind of schedule do you have, Dr. Corb? Uh, well, I'm okay now, thanks to one of your Cracker Jack assistants here, so... Uh. Okay, well, I, I know that you had another meeting. I appreciate you adjusting that. Um, thank you. I think we now go to uh, Dr. Graham. Oh, Dr. Graham has left. He went. And, and so, uh, Dr. Uh, Grunlin, I'm sorry, you were to be number two, and uh, now you are number three. Thank That's you. Fine. So do I need to do anything or am I live? You're live. Well, I'm live. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to appear here. And I'm very impressed that you were able to continue to work without lunch. <clears throat> uh, I've been asked to comment on two issues, uh, the National Missile Defense Testing Program and the compliance of various proposed NMD systems with the ABM Treaty. In light of President Clinton's recent announcement that his administration will not authorize deployment, of its planned NMD system, I have focused my comments to be relevant to the decisions the next president might make about this or any other national missile defense system. <clears throat> if the next president does decide to proceed with deployment of an NMD system, it may differ somewhat from the one that is currently under development. For example, the United States could take a totally different approach by developing a boost phase defense. However, if the United States continues to develop an NMD system designed to intercept missiles in the mid-course of their trajectory, it will necessarily operate in the same basic way as the one the Clinton administration has been developing. Any mid-course system, regardless of whether the interceptors are ground-based or sea-based or air-based, would use infrared homing, hit-to-kill interceptors guided by ground-based radars and space-based infrared sensors, as would the system currently under development. So let me now turn to the issue of the NMD test program. I will focus on several questions. What would the next administration need to know about the effectiveness of the NMD system before it could make a well-informed deployment decision? Based on the test conducted so far, what do we know? Based on the planned test program, what will we know and when will we know it? And finally, what would a test program look like that was adequate to provide the next administration with the information it needs to make a deployment decision. What should the United States know about any NMD system before it can make a well-informed deployment decision? As noted in the 1998 report of the Welsh panel, the first Welsh report, three steps are needed to demonstrate that an NMD technology is viable. So the test program must demonstrate first reliable hit to kill, second reliable hit to kill at a weapon system level, and third reliable hit to kill against real world targets. <clears throat> I note that there is a significant difference between demonstrating the ability to do something, which may require only one test, and demonstrating the ability to do so reliably, which requires many tests. Now the NMD test program, as we heard previously from um, Dr. Coyle, has demonstrated hit to kill but not reliable hit to kill nor reliable hit to kill at a weapon system level. However, there is no fundamental reason to doubt that the U.S. can do so, perhaps by the end of the 19 tests scheduled so far through the next four to five years. So I will focus on the third and the most demanding criteria laid out by the Welsh panel, demonstrating reliable hit to kill against real world targets, namely those that incorporate countermeasures. In his September 1st announcement that he would not authorize deployment, President Clinton stated that there, quote, remain questions to be resolved about the ability of the system to deal with countermeasures. Unfortunately, this is likely to remain the case unless major changes are made to the planned test program. At a fundamental level, the current test program is not configured to provide the next president with any information about whether the proposed NMD system could reliably intercept real-world targets with realistic countermeasures. 
Although the current NMD program assumes that the countermeasure threat will continue to evolve and that the full system that might be deployed after 2010 will be able to deal with complex countermeasures, all the tests conducted so far and all those scheduled through at least the first term of the next administration will be only of the system against the, quote, defined C1 threat. What is the defined C1 threat? How does it correspond to the real world threat? The detailed definition of the C1 threat is classified, but there is some public information that allows us to understand something about how it has been defined. The most detailed publicly available official document that discusses countermeasures that would be av available to emerging missile states is the September 1999 National Intelligence Estimate. It states that emerging missile states probably would rely on, quote, readily available technology to develop countermeasures, end quote, and that they could do so, quote, by the time they flight test their missiles. Moreover, the NIE lists several of these technologies that emerging missile states could use. However, in response to questions during his testimony before a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing on 29th of June earlier this summer, Lieutenant General Kadish stated that the defined C-1 threat does not include many of the countermeasure technologies identified in the NIE as being readily available to emerging missile states. Thus, the targets the NMD system would be tested against exclude the very countermeasures that the U.S. intelligence community has stated would be available by the time the missile threat exists. Another fundamental limitation of the testing program is that defense has known in advance what the expected characteristics of the decoy and the warhead would be. And there is no reason to assume that in the real world, the U.S. would know what the characteristics of an emerging missile state warhead would be. So unless the definition of the C-1 threat is changed, the test program continued by the next administration will tell us nothing about the ability of the proposed NMD system to intercept real world targets. So what would an adequate test program look like? The report, the Rumsfeld Commission report, called attention to two important issues relevant to countermeasure threat analysis. First, the failure to detect direct evidence does not mean that no such development is occurring. Second, given the possibility of emerging missile states hiding their development programs, a threat analysis must assess what weapons or what countermeasures a country is capable of developing. This has been dubbed ThinkInt or Think Intelligence. I was on a panel of 11 independent physicists and engineers that applied this ThinkInt methodology to understanding what countermeasures <coughs> would be available to a country able to develop and deploy a long-range ballistic missile. Our premise was that missile and countermeasure capabilities would be consistent with each other. The panel produced a very detailed uh, report, which I have here, um, which was published uh, in April of this year by the Union of Concerned Scientists and the MIT uh, Security Studies Program. In our analysis, we assumed that the NMD system had all of the sensors and interceptors planned for the full system that would be deployed by 2010 or later. This is the system the Pentagon says will be effective against missile attacks using complex countermeasures. <clears throat> we, in the report, survey the types of countermeasures that would be available to an emerging missile state and then go into considerable detail on three of those. First, are biological weapons deployed on submunitions? The second are nuclear weapons deployed with anti-simulation balloon decoys. And the third are nuclear weapons covered with liquid nitrogen cooled shrouds. Uh, there are more detail about this in my prepared testimony and I will skip over that here. Uh, but say that we found that each of these three countermeasures would defeat the fully deployed NMD system. Now, none of the technical analysis in our report has been publicly disputed, and I believe uh, in his testimony of today, Lieutenant General Kadish um, acknowledges that. The main criticism levied at our report is that we underestimated how difficult it would be for an emerging missile state to actually build and deploy the countermeasures we describe. We believe that this criticism is incorrect because a country capable of building both an intercontinental range ballistic missile and either a nuclear warhead or a biological warhead uh, to arm such a missile would clearly be able to build simple countermeasures. But there is a time-honored way to answer questions like this, which is do the experiment. 
As we recommend in the countermeasures report, the United States should establish an independent countermeasures red team whose job it would be to develop, build, and test countermeasures using technology available to emerging missile states. Because a red team would try to build countermeasures, this type of intelligence gathering has been referred to as TRIENT. And I believe it was Dr. Graham who initially dubbed it TRIENT. Then the planned NMD system should be tested against the countermeasures the red team determines would be available to potential attackers. So regardless of what NMD system the next administration pursues, it is essential that independent think-int and try-int programs be established to analyze and build countermeasures to the planned NMD. Once these programs determine which countermeasures were feasible, the United States must then assess how effective they would be against the planned NMD system through analysis and flight testing and should only decide to deploy a system once it has met all three of the Welch panel's criteria. In particular, and I will end with this, no NMD system should be deployed until it has demonstrated that it can reliably intercept real-world targets using countermeasures. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Dr. Holmes, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I feel like we're the last of the Mohicans here. Well, there's a little edge to this panel. I think it's uh, maybe lunch or something. Yes. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here today. I have with me, uh, as mentioned earlier, Baker Spring, who is the Heritage Foundation's senior analyst on missile defense matters, to here to help, help uh, answer any of your questions. I would like to take the opportunity uh, this afternoon, if I could, to uh, provide you with some of my conclusions regarding the implications not only of the July 7th missile defense test, but also of how the entire missile defense testing program is going. My first conclusion is that uh, weak missile defense technology was not the cause of the failed intercept test on July 7th. The primary reason the test interceptor did not destroy its target was because of a problem with the rocket technology that is 20 years old and that was built 10 years ago. It is therefore factually incorrect to conclude that the failure of the July 7th test proves that missile defenses are not technologically feasible. If anything, the results of other tests in the past suggest the opposite. During the first flight test of the kill vehicle in October of last year, the system found and destroyed its target without the benefit of many of the advanced tracking, command control, and communication technologies now being tested. And over the last year, the Ballistic Missile Defense Organ uh, Organization can claim six successful test intercepts of theater and national missile defense technology compared with only three significant failures. I think no fair assessment of the facts could lead anyone to conclude that a 66% success rate suggests that missile defenses are not technologically feasible and therefore should not be deployed. As a matter of fact, that is basically the conclusion that Secretary of Defense Cohen has, has reached. My second conclusion is that even if the July 7 test were a failure and can be blamed on new missile defense technologies, it would, not, it would make no difference as far as the, as the decision to deploy is concerned. A decision to deploy a national missile defense has already been made. The National Missile Defense Act of 1999 requires the feeling of a national missile defense system as soon as is technologically possible. Signed by President Clinton on July 27, 2, 1999, this act is the law of the land. It is therefore a legal requirement that the federal government continue to develop and test a variety of systems to find the most effective and near-term alternative. The Congress and the President have spoken. We must now find out how best to proceed, not whether to proceed. My third conclusion is that removing testing restraints will reduce technical risk, risk in the program. The administration's National Missile Defense Testing Program is focused ex is exclusively on the option of deploying interceptor interceptors at a fixed land-based site. This rules out other approaches that may prove to be more technologically feasible and more militarily effective. For example, despite the wealth of recommendations that the U.S. pursue a sea-based option, the administration policies bars even the development and testing, let alone the deployment of sea-based systems. The Clinton administration's uh, refusal to test sea-based systems is all the more puzzling because they appear to be so, uh, so promising. For example, uh, recent press reports indicate that a Pentagon study requested by Congress, but, it, but, but which the Congress has not yet received, states that a sea-based system would add significant capabilities to the land-based interceptors of the sort that was tested on July 7th. 
Furthermore, the Chief of Naval Operations on February 18th stated in a memorandum to the Secretary of Defense that foreclosing the sea-based option would, I quote, not be in the best long-term interests of our country, end quote. I agree with the CNO that foreclosing the sea-based option would be short-sighted, which raises a question. If testing is required to discern the feasibility of land-based technologies, why is it ruled out to discern the feasibility of sea-based systems? The answer appears to be in the administration's adherence to the ABM Treaty. The constraints that the ABM Treaty is imposing on the testing program are having serious effects, as Dr. Graham has said, both on the quality and the timetable of the entire missile defense program, as they have had on a number of missile defense programs over the last decades. For example, the Patriot missiles of Gulf War fame were deliberately downgraded during the 1970s and the 1980s to comply with the ABM Treaty. As a result, the United States had to deploy systems less capable than they could have during Desert Storm. Like the Patriot, the Navy's Aegis tracking systems and interceptors have been repeatedly downgraded to comply with the ABM Treaty. The system was constrained in the 1980s to, void, to avoid a, a violation of the treaty. But the Bush administration later initiated a substantial upgrade to the system that would allow it to track and intercept ballistic missiles. Unfortunately, because of the ABM Treaty, the Clinton administration severely cut and delayed this program. The Clinton administration uh, imposed uh, restrictions on the testing of theater defense systems, which prevent external sensors from providing early warning tracking and targeting data about possible launches to the interceptor. And likewise, a system of space-based low-altitude sensors, which could have allowed the Navy theater-wide system to provide limited protection from attacks on American soil, also have been delayed. And as uh, Chairman Shays mentioned this morning, I can find, I can find no other reason than the ABM Treaty to understand why the Alaska radar was not being constructed. If there was, in fact, no technological reason, although we did not hear from the panel this morning, I would uh, venture uh, to say that the main reason was because they considered it to be a violation of the ABM Treaty, and that was the main reason why they decided to uh, not to uh, proceed. Despite the outcome of the July 7th test, the Pentagon, I think, must move forward quickly with the development and deployment of missile defenses for America. And to that end, Congress and the executive branch should make every effort to field missile defenses as soon as technologically possible, as the law requires. We should be abandoning the policy of trying to revive the defunct ABM Treaty and lift all restrictions on testing of missile defense systems. We've been talking all morning about testing. The assumption, apparently, behind testing is to try to get the best system you can get. The ABM Treaty is restricting the way we do, it, do that job. I also recommend that a sea-based element be included in all missile defense deployment plans and that Congress be holding more hearings at the earliest possible time about alternative technical options uh, like the sea-based system that I, uh, that I mentioned before. Mr. Chairman, the Clinton administration has chosen to impose restraints on the testing of missile defense systems. If missile defense testing continues to be managed in this way, the testing restraints will produce the self-fulfilling prophecy of ineffective systems. By intentionally foregoing promising avenues of development, such as the sea-based systems, the administration has chosen a course that will inevitably result in a system that will not be optimally effective. Our goal should be, instead, to develop and deploy the most effective missile defense system possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. This will uh, be a very interesting panel to hear your answers to the questions. And uh, we'll start with uh, um, Helen chenoweth Hage. You did that right, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. It confuses me sometimes, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you, very Mr. gracious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to direct uh, some of my comments or questions to Mr. Korb. Um, Mr. Korb, you commented on the Patriot uh, missile. Mm -hmm. anti-missile missile. But wasn't the Patriot anti-missile missile designed originally for, as an anti-aircraft? That, that's how it started. As a matter of fact, it was uh, former Vice President Quayle that got the Congress uh, to put money to upgrade that to give it an anti-missile capability. That was not put forward by the, uh, the uh, Reagan or Bush administrations. That, mm -hmm. is, uh, that is correct. It was originally built uh, as, uh, as an anti-aircraft system. And a very courageous Army colonel in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, actually uh, directed the startup of the production uh, lines on his own authority, he recently retired, but uh, he upgraded the, uh, the software and, and deployment system uh, in the Patriot. But, uh, you know, it's my understanding, Mr. Korb, that 
that the U.S. aerospace community has repeatedly met more daunting uh, and challenging engineering challenges than that posed by finishing up what we've already started. And it would seem to me that our biggest concerns as a Congress should be looking at better management practices. I mean, in your testimony, you stated that we need to be involved in at least seven more years of vigorous research uh, before we can make an informed choice on deployment. But if we could concentrate on some of the management practices and removal of the political constraints, I think that we would be miles ahead. And Mr. Korb, this is the reason I make this statement. We've had a number of successes that we're not talking about. And uh, we, we muddle around in, in the ABM treaty and we forget the successes that have been instituted and have actually occurred since 1955, when we first started this. Now, using pre-SDI technology in 1984, the Army's, Army's Ho uh, experiment launched from an island in the Pacific, uh, South Pacific, a Volkswagen-sized uh, uh, kill vehicle to inter intercept a Minuteman missile launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base in Southern California. That was a success, wasn't it? The, um, are you talking about the homing overlay experiment? I'm talking about the homing overlay experiment. Well, as it turned out, later on, the Congress found out that that test was rigged, unfortunately, and it came to light uh, after uh, the administration left office. And in fact, there was a, a GAO investigation and, and a congressional. I, I, well, I don't disagree with your point that we could eventually get the technology. I think if you, to the extent that you do concurrent research development, you are increasing the chances that, it's, that you're going to have what uh, General Wells called a rush to failure. I'd also point out that not every system works. Uh, we have had f spectacular failures. The division air defense gun was a system that we tried to rush and it never worked. In fact, it was because of the, the testing there that Congress passed the law that set up uh, Mr. Mr. Coyle's office. Secretary Cheney had to cancel the A-12 because it just wasn't working. So uh, it, may, it, it, it may work, but my point is to the extent that you rush, you increase the chances that it won't. The other thing, this is not just another system. This, if it doesn't work, then you're going to have what uh, Chairman Burton talked about before, uh, missiles raining down on, on, on the country, and, and then all the money you've spent will have gone in vain. It's not like flying a plane, you get to go make a, make a second pass. Well, you know, because there have been allegations of tests being rigged, I'm not convinced that they were. And I, what I am convinced of is this, that we learned a lot from that launch, that whole launch. And in, in addition to that, the Air Force successfully intercepted a dying low-altitude satellite with, it, with its miniature homing vehicle launched from an F-15, also using pre-SDI technology. Um, the SDI program instituted a major technology demonstration program that placed priority on dramatically reducing the size and weight of uh, critical compulsion and sensor and data processing and other electronic systems. We've already done that in, to enable an effective hit-to-kill interceptor system. Why are we continuing to drape crepe? Most notable among these demonstration systems was the Delta series, or what, what has become familiar to us as the Delta Star series in 1989. Um, which over a nine-month period gathered very important information. That, that's all been done. Also in 1989, um, the Army's uh, ERIS program repeated the Ho experience uh, with a much lighter interceptor kill vehicle and uh, using mid-1980s technology. And there have been numerous other experiments uh, that demonstrate the maturity of the basic technologies. So I don't want to see us just mull around in the ABM treaty and, and while other countries are advancing their systems and we're muddled down trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, the SDI program uh, has produced the um, the technology that was demonstrated uh, in the award-winning 1994 Clementine 
uh, mission, which returned to the moon for the first time in 25 years and provided over a million frames of optical data. That's, that's all in our history of what we've produced. Um, but unfortunately, President Clinton in his short-lived veto, a line item veto uh, authority killed the Clementine, an award-winning program that all of aerospace looked at. So, Mr. Corb, my concern is, as, as former President John Kennedy was uh, noted as saying regarding the space program, one can always make the perfect the enemy of the good, and this seems to me to be exactly what we're trying to do by not recognizing the accomplishments, but, comp but focusing on, on our, um, our, our test setbacks. Um, so I thank, you for your, I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Spring about the ABM Treaty. You know, it seems to me that this treaty has succeeded in its purpose of broad blocking the development, testing, and deployment of an effective defense anti-ballistic missile system, at least for the United States. And that last parenthetical uh, phrase is what concerns us all. Sure. Uh, this seems to meet the objectives of, of those who wish to preserve the Cold War mutual assured destruction policy that I've referred to earlier a doctrine uh, which may benefit some, but certainly doesn't move us to mutual assured survivability. Um, I, I wonder if you would like to comment on that. Well, certainly the treaty does, and it was designed to, from the outset, impose limitations on development and testing as well as deployment. Those restrictions are found in Articles 5 and 6 of the treaty. Um, they affect sea-based, space-based, mobile, uh, ground-based, and air-based systems. Um, in my judgment, in terms of development and testing, to put it in the context of, say, for example, the moon mission, we would say that, well, we're going to go to the moon, but we have a restriction that we can't use liquid-fueled rockets, or that we can't use advanced computer technology. That, in other words, that all of the options that would otherwise be put on the table are now being taken off as a matter of political constraint and diplomatic constraint. The other restriction in Article 6 says we can't take theater missile defense systems and upgrade them to give them a long range or a strategic ballistic missile defense capability. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that our most advanced technologies, because they've been proceeding in relative terms to the NMD system now, in a relatively unconstrained fashion, are among the most advanced. And therefore, some of the best avenues to providing, in my judgment, the most effective missile defense system that we can obtain as soon as possible, according to law, um, would be to upgrade our, our missile defense systems that are now categorized as theater defenses. Um, those include, most particularly, the Navy theater-wide program. Um, so that, in, in, in my judgment, we're proceeding to this pro in this program essentially with one hand tied behind our backs as a result of the diplomatic and political constraints that are imposed on it through what I view to be unilateral observance of ABM restrictions as a matter of policy by the Clinton administration. It's not, in my judgment, a free and fair exploration of all the technological options that would be available to the defense community. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Holmes, Mr. Spring, I, I'm a little struck by what I think is a rather extreme argument in your statement that the ABM Treaty should no longer be considered binding uh, based on an argument, I guess, that since the Soviet Union dissolved, Russia is not bound by the same agreements. <clears throat> and uh, it, I see that you cited a couple of prominent individuals who share that view, but I'd like to ask you a question about the implications of that. Do you believe on that basis that no treaties currently exist between Russia and the United States other than the few that we might have signed since the breakup of the Soviet Union? So I guess that would mean that no previous arms treaties, no status of force agreements, no trade pacts, none of these continue to exist in your mind? Uh, well, uh, many of the treaties that existed with the Soviet Union have been handled on an individual basis. Uh, and so has actually the ABM Treaty. There was a multilateralization treaty, a successor agreement that was signed with four countries, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia, that the Clinton administration signed. 
and uh, must be sent up to the Senate for its advice and consent before it becomes the law of the land. So even the administration believes that something must be done to, f to have a legally binding treaty, otherwise they would not have negotiated that agreement. So therefore, my, to answer your question, is they had to be, you have to handle each one of these agrees, agreements separately. The ABM treaty has been handled separately. It's now a successor agreement that has to be sent up to the Senate. If the Senate approves that and ratifies it, then it'll be binding. If it doesn't, What about be. the status of forces agreements and trade packs? Do you think they're all out the window? No. Okay. You. Let, let me answer that question. Um, the finding that we had done for us by the law firm of Hunt and Williams was um, that the ABM treaty was null and void by reason of impossibility of performance. That is, is that there was no state in existence today that could fulfill the obligations the treaty imposed on the Soviet Union primarily for reasons of geographic scope. The ABM Treaty imposed restrictions with regard to the territory of the Soviet Union, which Russia does not control. As a result of the impossibility of performance on obligations that are unique to the ABM Treaty, the treaty is null and, vo and, vo null and void by force of international law. Um, that does not speak to the obligations of the United States relative to other treaty obligations with the Soviet Union and the succession issues that would surround them. Thanks. Uh, could I just, could I add one thing to that, sure. if I may? Uh, this is also the, the view, by the way, not only of the uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but also the Senate Majority Leader, uh, who have, in many communications with the White House, made the same point that we have made here, uh, primarily that the successor agreement must be sent up to the Senate for ratification before it becomes the law of the land. Terrific. Dr. Quinlan. Let me ask you about the latest intercept flight test of the IFT-5. The Department of Defense provided a briefing and, and gave us some slides, and, and one of them listed all the mission objectives that were supposedly accomplished by that IFT-5 test. And when you look at it, it well, first, you know, what countermeasures were included in that target suite? There, there was one large spherical balloon decoy. And what happened to the deployment of that particular countermeasure? Uh, it, it didn't inflate didn't deploy properly. So I guess, I well, mean, in my parlance anyway, that would be an unsuccessful intercept, wouldn't you think so? Well, they never got to the point of testing the intercept, because the kill vehicle did not release from the booster properly. Can you explain to me then how the Department of Defense indicates that for discrimination, the full objective of their plan was met? How would they get to that conclusion, given that scenario? Uh, I, no, I don't know that, actually. Um, I don't. No. Can I add, let me discuss with you a little bit. You mentioned three different countermeasures that you thought were, um, you know, that you actually went into further depth in your report. Yes. One of them was submunitions. Yes. And as I understand it, you're not really talking about submunitions with nuclear warheads. You're talking about submunitions with biological or chemical warheads. Particularly biological warheads. And the premise being that any country like North Korea, Iran, or Iraq, if they were to have the capacity to send up an interballistic missile, mm -hmm. they probably also have the capacity to use submunitions on those. Right. A country that had an ICBM and had a biological weapon would also be able to se simply separate that agent into 100 or more bomblets. This was something that I, I believe the Rumsfeld Commission first noted would be a, a uh, an option for an emerging missile state. And people have raised various concerns about reentry heating, about dispersal, and those are the things that we looked into in great detail in our report. And your report indicated that submunitions. That if the would... country could already have a biological weapon that it could deliver by a long range missile, it could just as readily put them on submunitions. <clears throat> now, if you had as few as five missiles. Yes. Could you put 100 submunitions on each one? Yes. So you'd have 500 submunitions of biological agent coming over, dispersing right. it wide. In fact, that'd probably be preferable, wouldn't it? If you were a rogue country and you really wanted to disperse that agent, it'd be better to have 100 different uh, places of release than it would be just one, right? It probably would, yes. So if you had 500 coming over, what even after we go to C3 on this stage, what are the total number of interceptors that the system currently envisions? Uh, which is 250 interceptors, even if they were perfectly effective, um, fewer than half of the uh, bomblets would be destroyed. So we should probably be real honest with the American people and tell them that in terms of biological weapons at least, yes. this system doesn't cut it. Right, right. 
And, and I would guess, we might even make the argument that if I were a rogue nation, I'd be encouraged to go that path as opposed to nuclear, since I knew you might be trying to, pro to provide some sort of a nuclear deterrent. Um, that is a possibility. I mean, the other reason biological agents might be more attractive than nuclear weapons to an emerging missile state is that it's hard to get the fissile material that you need to make a nuclear weapon. Um, and, for example, North Korea reportedly has enough material to make one or two nuclear weapons, but there's no, you know, there's no de facto limit to how many biological weapons it could make. Will you talk to us uh, for a bit about uh, the difference, difference between effectiveness and confidence? Oh boy, okay. Um, let's say um, that you want to have a system that is 95% effective. But you also need to know with some amount of certainty what the effectiveness is. For example, if I gave you a coin, I said this coin is weighted. I want you to tell me what the weighting is. And I, and I let you flip it once and it lands on heads. Would you then say, I am 100% certain that this coin is weighted so that it will always come up heads? No. Okay, so there's, there's both a certain a confidence level of what the effectiveness is or what, if you're looking at the coin example, how the coin is weighted. And the only way you can become co highly confident of what the weighting of the coin actually is is by flipping it a lot of times. Or the analogy with missile defense testing, the only way you can know with high confidence how effective the system would be is to test it a lot of times. Now, if we had, and I won't go into all of those, but we talked earlier of the, a fairly <laughs> significant number of relatively simple countermeasures that were available now to rogue nations. Right. It wouldn't be enough to test against each one of those countermeasures individually. Wouldn't we have to test about them in different combinations? Ideally, to have confidence the system would work against an attack using countermeasures, you would want to consider a lot of different possibilities, a lot of different real-world conditions, yes. Mr. Kaur, maybe I just ask you to answer this. If we didn't have great confidence in a system, what good is it to us? Uh, could you speak a little louder? Sure. If we don't have a high level of confidence in the effectiveness of this type of national missile defense system, would it still be an important element, or what sort of an element would it be in our uh, entire well, defense? Well, it, it obviously would be much more important than any other system, because the purpose of this is to prevent an attack by a rogue nation using a weapon of mass destruction. And if it doesn't work, all of the money you've spent is wasted. It's not just another weapon system. I mean, we have lots of weapon systems. If, an airplane goes in and, and it misses its target, you can come back again and do it. But you get one shot at this, and if you miss, then in fact you've wasted all your money. So that's why it's, you have to have a higher degree of confidence that it will be effective. So therefore, the more important so It's much testing. more important to, to test it more, say, than the B-1 bomber. I mean, the B-1 bomber, we rushed into production. It hasn't worked, but it didn't mean uh, as much uh, as this would because we then came with the B-2 and we had other ways to deliver bombs on target. One of the supposed purposes for this uh, system is to avoid accidental launchings or, or to at least protect against accidental launchings from Russia or some other country. They already have significant, sophisticated countermeasures, don't they? Oh, the so well, the Soviets have not only countermeasures, they have uh, warheads with, mul I mean, they have uh, missiles with multiple warheads on them. And remember, that's why they first developed the multiple warheads, was to be decoys, and then somebody said, gee, why do you want to make them decoys? Let's make them real. And so, in effect, you, 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 you know, it spreads apart, and you, you then have to, you, even if you hit one, the other three, four, or ten get through. So we, it's not really effective against a biological submunition scenario, and it has limited effect against an accidental uh, launch from Russians with multiple warheads. If it's a multiple warhead, that's, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I would like to ask if any of you would like to comment to any question that wasn't asked of you uh, by Helen or, or, or John. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, I'd like to comment on this idea that the uh, missile defense system has to be perfect or near perfect before it can justify actually building it. Uh, first of all, I know of no weapon system that I know of that demands perfection before uh, you uh, actually begin uh, deployment. But the idea that somehow uh, we would have uh, more or less permanently 
after we made a decision to deploy a national missile defense system that would forever be static or stays the way it is, it will not improve over time, seems to me, seems to, me to underestimate the, uh, not only uh, what we've learned from the history of the development of weapon systems, but also would underestimate the technological capacity of this country. Because the fact of the matter is, is it's, hard, it's hard for me to imagine if we, made, if we actually deployed a missile defense system, that it would be 100% failure. I, it might have failure at the margins. Perhaps sometimes it would catch some missile. Maybe it won't catch all of them. But it would at least catch some of them. And so therefore, there would be some effect on the saving the lives of Americans, even if it is only partially successful. So the idea that it has to be 100% successful before we even make the decision to deploy seems to me to be a false assumption. Um, also, okay. it, it, maybe if I could just say something quickly with regard to biological threat. Um, and that is, is that first, the argument that is put forward with regard to the biological threat, in my judgment, is a perfect argument for why we need a boost phase capability, which we're currently prohibited from even testing and developing, let alone deploying. The second is, is that at least with regard to biological uh, uh, attack, um, by missile or any other means, there's at least some reasonable options for civil defense. And I certainly advocate that we move forward with regard to those capabilities for homeland defense. But with a nuclear weapon, I think that the options for that are, 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 are limited indeed. So that um, uh, I, I think that you have some options with regard to biological attack that you wouldn't have in the case of nuclear attack. Let me make one comment on something that was said earlier, and that has to do with the National Missile Defense Act of 1999. I think an important point in the legislative history of that is Senator Levin's amendment to it, which talks about the fact, not just technologically feasible, but of the arms control implications. And so I think you cannot just say, just because it's technologically feasible, that's the end of the situation. As I read the legislative history and the Levin Amendment, I think that also is a factor in the, in the, in the decision. Let me comment on that. I'm sorry. Well, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. OK, yeah. we're going to be here forever. We all get one shot here, because no, 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 no. I've got to. And I haven't gotten mine yet. <laughs> I'd like I, to comment. I, I thought I was in charge, but oh. anyway. <laughs> I'd like to comment on the notion of the need for 100% perfection. There is a difference, this is the question um, Mr. Tierney asked me, between the effectiveness and the confidence level. At a fundamental level, aside from how effective the system would actually be, the U.S. will not know how effective it will be, which will make it very difficult to plan for using it. Now, one of the things that Secretary of Defense Cohen says, in fact, he says the real reason we need this system is to preserve U.S. freedom of action so the U.S. can continue to use its conventional forces around the world without fear of threat of, uh, of uh, being hit by a ballistic missile. And he says if we have a national missile defense, we don't need to worry about that. But in fact, if we have a national missile defense, the president and the policy planners will not know how effective it would be. So if we're now postulating that we're going to go around the world, preserving our freedom of action to intervene, and yet we don't know how effective our NMD system is, that could put us in a situation where we're actually encouraging attacks that otherwise wouldn't have happened. And we still don't know how effective the system is. And, and uh, 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 feelings aside, uh, you know, whether or not um, people feel that the system would be somewhat effective is irrelevant. It hasn't been proven. We have no basis. We have no basis for knowing what the effectiveness is. Okay. Let me, uh, you know, I don't know why I need to say this, but um, for anyone in my staff to suggest when a hearing ends is, <laughs> is, is more difficult than developing a national missile defense system. <laughs> so, um, and all of you have come before committees before, so I don't know how many members attend a hearing and they get the right to ask questions. Mr. Springer, I want to just hear what your comment is. Uh, on, on the... What did you want to say? Yeah, I was going to say with regard to the National Missile Defense Act, it was very clear in my judgment from that legislative record is that the, is that the, is that the dual goals of deploying a national missile defense system, or a requirement in that case, and the goal for offensive reductions, um, that is also mentioned in the act, are not dependent on each other. In other words, it is not a case that, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the search for offensive reductions is indeed a requisite for the deployment of a national missile defense system under the act. Great. Let me just ask now my question. Well, I, I disagree respectfully okay, on that, and I think the legislative history will support 
uh, will support my position. And again, I, I, I think if we're going to, I didn't comment on some of the things they say. If we're going to keep going this, I think we ought to adjourn for lunch and come back. I thought you told us each to give one, you know, one thing we wish we were, were asked. But I have strong disagreements. Well, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear them. And, okay. you know, and we'll get out of here at five of. I'll, I'll hit the <laughs> gavel, but I'd like to hear them. The whole purpose of this is to, to have some uh, issue of where the battle is. And uh, okay. so do you want to just list where you okay. disagree? Okay. Uh, and and I, th I think the point is that, no, we're not saying this has to be a perfect system, but it has to be better than your average weapon system. And that, in fact, a lot of weapon systems never do work. Uh, that there is a history of weapon systems, even with a lot of money, not exactly, uh, you know, being able to carry it out. And I think we have to recognize that as we go into this, into this debate. You have 435 members of Congress, 100 senators, and we have been somewhat over the lot on this issue. But I've always believed in my heart of hearts that someday we will want a missile defense system. I didn't want nuclear weapons in space, but I didn't mind that we had sensors there. And I, I, I basically have come to believe that we need to have a limited national defense system. Uh, I just love to know in very short terms whether you, doctor, would feel that we need that or it sh we shouldn't even consider it. Um, I think that it is something the U.S. should continue R&D on. Okay. But I don't think it helps the cause to deploy something that can't do the job. Fair enough. But you, but you are, are, are willing to say that we should continue to see if we can develop a system. Sure. Yeah. Dr. Yeah, I think we ought to continue research and development un and until we have a reasonable prospect that it will do what it's supposed to do. But like any other weapon system, you have to do a cost effectiveness analysis in terms of what you will cost, what you will get, and what you will give up to get, to, uh, to get it. Dr. Holmes? Well, yes, I think that it's a strategic requirement. It's uh, the law of the land. I think that uh, the disagreements and problems with the Russians can be worked out. We were very near doing that in the early 1990s in the Bush administration. And I think that uh, from what I have seen from uh, uh, talking to technical experts, that you can have a reasonable assurance that over time you will have an effective system. Now, is it true f that ABM, it, some of you uh, suggest it is, prevent us from developing a system, um, Dr. Grenland, maybe you would respond, that, that gives us all the options for developing a system? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but one, one charge that has been made is that the U.S. Um, is prevented from developing a sea-based system by the ABM Treaty right. and that this would be much more effective. In fact, it would have the very same limitations that the land-based system would have. So I don't think the ABM Treaty is standing in the way of the U.S. I mean, there are, there are problems well before that in terms of developing an effective system. Dr. Holmes, you introduced, but let me just hear Dr. Corbett. Yeah, I, I agree that at, at some point the ABM treaty will prevent you from doing what you want, but I don't think we're there yet. No, but, but doing what you want in terms of deployment or doing what you want in terms of even developing the maximum and best system? Well, I, I, I agree with you know, what Dr. Gunlin said, that we're not there yet. That we, we, in other words, I see no evidence that the program that has been started really since the mid-1980s has ever gotten to the point where you'd have to say, well, gee, if there wasn't an ABM treaty, then I could start now today to go ahead and move to the, uh, into the next step. Maybe, Mr. Spring, I should have you just, you're the one who introduced it yeah. in your concept of liquid fuel versus... Yes, e exactly. My concern more generally is, I'll come back to the sea base system, is that if what we do is at the outset say that we're going to limit ourselves to R&D, and in fact limit ourselves only to a narrow scope of R&D, you will never be in the position to get to saying at the level of assurance that my colleagues on the panel want to obtain um, the level of confidence for deployment. Um, yeah, but, but let me just specifically, is there any type of testing that we are prevented to do be able to do because of the ABA. ABA. Absolutely. And, an and, and let, let me see. just use a specific example. We cannot, under the administration's policy as it interprets the ABM treaty and applies it today, test a sea-based ballistic missile for ascent phase intercept capability against a ballistic missile um, that flies, flies faster than five kilometers per second. Okay. And, and, and that's a, a significant example. Any others? Um, 
the, the same thing would obtain to range, 3,500 kilometers against a target ballistic missile with a range in excess of 3,500 kilometers. You want to go in there? I want, want, I want uh, Dr. Grunland to respond to that. <laughs> but we're not at the point where that's an issue. I mean, we do not have a sea-based system that is capable of intercepting long-range missiles. And if we did, it would have the same technical issues associated with it as the ground-based no. system. The basing mode is irrelevant if it's a mid-course hit-to-kill interceptor. Where it's launched from is, is irrelevant to whether it will work and whether it can deal with countermeasures. Okay, let me let, uh, if we could just divide up the next 10 minutes and then we'll call it quick. <coughs> uh, fine, thank you. Sir. I actually have less than that. I think early on when uh, Mr. Allen was making his remarks that uh, he was pretty salient when he said that if we had a system uh, that actually could work to a high degree of effectiveness that we had confidence in and that wasn't going to end up with less security for this country in terms of our relations with other countries and the effect that it would have overall, then we should all look at trying to implement it. And the fact of the matter is that we're not anywhere near that yet. We're not anywhere near that in terms of the technical capability of this program. And I think the evidence has shown that uh, very clearly today. And I think there are still some larger questions as how we relate to our uh, former adversaries now, uh, friends hopefully, as well as our allies, and all the other considerations, and then the further considerations of whether or not this is the best priority uh, for us to be attending to when in fact there are any number of other dangers, not the least of which are biological weapons and chemical weapons and other ways of delivery uh, that we ought to be considering. So that all of those things said, uh, I think the President's decision was right where it should have been, that it was much too premature to deploy, and I think that the, the plan of the National Missile Defense at current time does not allow for the degree of testing uh, that would warrant us to feel real confident that this is the direction we want to go in. We should have a plan that has a lot more testing that would give us a lot more confidence in the effectiveness of this particular system before we move forward, and then it should have a system or a regime where those tests are analyzed by a relatively independent agency, by an absolutely independent agency. Uh, and if it's going to be Mr. P Coyle's group, and I think he's done a marvelous job in a lot of things that he's done, then people ought to have to listen to him. The legislation that we have now setting up his uh, branch merely gives him advisory capacity. And he, although he was right on the money <coughs> with the status, the current status of our situation and the fact that we shouldn't deploy, the Department of Defense was fully ready to ignore his advice in this particular occasion. I don't think that's a healthy thing for us. So I think the witnesses today have done us a considerable service, both panels, and I want to thank this panel very much for taking your time and extending late into the, uh, later into the afternoon than certainly you anticipated, but I think it's been extremely helpful, and I want to thank you. Where I, I come down is to wonder the significance, pardon me? Thank you. <laughs> I, I did want to ask another question before I said where I come down, so thank you for interrupting. Uh, I, I am not clear as to why I should care what Europe feels about ABM uh, when this was an agreement negotiated with the Russians and, in my judgment, is somewhat outdated. And, Mr. Corb, you can respond to that and then I'll throw it out to the others. Well, you, you got a practical, one practical reason. If you want an effective system, the one that's under development, you're going to need consent of Denmark and England to put the, the uh, the, the enhance the radars in their country. That's one. Uh, I think uh, num number two, you do have a, uh, a whole set of relationships with Europe uh, that go into to lots, uh, in lots of areas, not the least of which is the future of, uh, of, of NATO. And if, in fact, you create a situation where there's a break between the United States and, uh, and Europe in, in terms of the way that they approach problems, this, this will, will undermine us. But they didn't negotiate the ABM treaty with us. No, I, I understand. I understand. And the, I am not arguing that you have to give them a veto. But your question is, should we be concerned? I think you need to be concerned with how, how they feel, because we have a whole web of relationships with them that could be, be affected. Now, in the final analysis, I don't think anybody would argue that the United States should let other nations have a veto over its security. Nobody's arguing that. But what you're talking about here is you're not at a stage where you want to force that issue and the consequences, given what's happened 
with with the, with with the tech with the technology. You, even Dr. Kissinger, who supports that, in, in the piece he wrote in the Washington Post, said, you know, before you go ahead with you know abrogating ABM treaty and uh, causing all these things, you better decide what system you have, and you know that you're ready to to uh, to to go ahead with it. Thank you, Dr. Grunlin. Then I'll come to you, Dr. Yes, uh, Dr. Grunlin. Uh, comment about that question I asked in regards to paying attention to the Europeans? I, I think you well, made I that. Think that. Yes, I, I guess I was. Um, I, mean, I think U.S. security is more than just the sum of the weapon systems that we deploy. And in, in part, it, re it relies on our alliance relationship and our relationship to countries that aren't our allies yet, in particular Russia and China. So what we're trying to do, I hope, um, is to maximize our security overall. And it, it may well be that going forward with something that has marginal security benefits in terms of being able to defend against emerging missile states and upsets our allies in Europe and upsets Russia and China would be a net negative. So I think that's a valid question. That, that really is the, the big picture that we all should be looking at. Dr. Holmes. I certainly wouldn't advocate ignoring our allies in Europe, but I think one of the reasons why they are so hesitant, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons is why is because they sense that the administration is not fully committed to the program. And therefore, sensing that they're not getting any leadership from the United States, say, for example, the kind of leadership that you got from uh, Ronald Reagan during the Euro missile crisis, when there was also a tremendous debate about the deployment of SS-20 missiles in Europe. That kind of leadership shows that the Allies will come along when the United States leads. The United States is not leading on this issue. They sense weakness, they sense uncertainty, so therefore they're hesitating and, and, and holding back. And the idea that uh, the President said last week when he announced his decision to delay deployment, he said no nation has a veto over deployment. If you look at the speech the way that it came, he had spoken for almost six or seven minutes about why, because of China, because of Russia, because of NATO allies, etc., he was making the decision because of their objections that he was not going to proceed. And then it proceeds to say that there, no nation has a veto. Is that a theoretical possibility, or is in fact is that always going to be the case because of the uncertainty that Russia and China have? Thank you. My, my observation is uh, simply to say that uh, our national missile defense system is, in fact, the law of the land. I'm not convinced, frankly, and I'm happy to have you comment, but I'm not convinced that the administration was an eager participant. Um, and so it leaves me a little uneasy. I would have thought that we would have had an opportunity to force the question with our allies with the ability to move forward with the missile defense uh, detection um, in, in Alaska and uh, that we still would have left open uh, tremendous options. But if I were our allies, I wouldn't be convinced that we're supporting this program, even though it is, in fact, the law of the land. Uh, but I, I recognize that it makes no, no sense to deploy it until we know, one, it works, and uh, two, that we can actually afford it. Um, just a last comment from you or anyone else? Well, I'm just before we leave the impression that the law of the land uh, is, as it was stated a couple of times here, and Mr. Korb, I think, uh, certainly hit on this, that the law of the land is that we'll go forward if there's an effective national missile defense uh, system that is technologically feasible and ready to be deployed, and keeping mindful of our relationships with our allies and the nonproliferation regime and things that we've been working on, so that all has to be taken together. I think the administration was fully aware of all of those different factors, and, and this system clearly wasn't ready to go to deployment when those things were considered, and that's why the decision was properly made. With that, uh, you get to go to your meeting that was two hours ago, <laughs> and uh, we will uh, adjourn this hearing. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. I didn't mean to cut your eyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's what's coming up on C-SPAN. Next, today's launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission to provide maintenance to the International Space Station.